بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ولكم everybody in our uh, second day of our uh, workshop the basic intensive care workshop and uh, yesterday was a uh, very successful day all the uh, speaker uh, presenting um, uh, very interesting topics and uh, today we will uh, continue with uh, our speakers and the only change will be today is we will uh, change the schedule for Dr. Fadi Georges. Fadi will be starting the first, and then we will continue on the same uh, schedule. So only Dr. Fadi will be starting the uh, first speaker. Uh, Dr. Fadi, yesterday, he was uh, presenting the uh, point of care uh, using of the uh, ultrasound in uh, COVID patient. And uh, Dr. Fadi is a cardiovascular imaging and clinical cardiologist specialist. And today he will talk about the protocol of criteria and the criteria for weaning from uh, mechanical uh, ventilator. Uh, even Dr. Fadi will ask, but uh, his presentation will be recorded and it will be shared now. But uh, Dr. Fadi is available for any question and answer. So we will start the first lecture with uh, Dr. Fadi. Ahmed, can you please share the... Meaning patients is for the mechanical ventilator. Is the sound clear for all? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a great honor to be here again with all of you during the second day of this spectacular basic IC workshop. Um, I'll be talking today about the protocols and parameters of weaning patients of the mechanical ventilator. Um, so I'll start as usual with the basic key points um, of this lecture. Uh, first, we will define the weaning process of each single uh, individual patient according to the um, condition and the disease. Uh, then we will define also the terms and abbreviations commonly used uh, in mechanical ventilated patients. Uh, terms on the mechanical ventilator itself on different uh, parameters, different uh, vendors, um, because usually we hear a lot of abbreviations. So we need to know what does it mean. Uh, what are the parameters for assessing the patient's readiness uh, to be weaned from the mechanical ventilation? We'll talk as well about the modes of weaning and different protocols uh, acquired according to different societies as well. Uh, we will speak and we will illustrate which patients are difficult to wean 
how long does it take to wean off the sedation, which is a very valid point uh, that uh, sometimes uh, uh, early weaning uh, can lead to the failure of the weaning itself. Uh, and last, we will uh, uh, include two last points which are very vital as well. The tips to optimize the weaning and extubation success uh, according to checklist we will provide. Uh, again, at the end, we will also provide different life scenarios for patients who had uh, encountered failed weaning process. So first, we will define the weaning. Uh, it is defined as a progressive decline in the amount of ventilatory support that a patient receives from a ventilator. So the weaning process basically includes uh, three parameters, mainly. This process includes first the decreased ventilatory support, assessing the patient's response, and finally, possibly extubating the patient. Well, we know that eventually the purpose of the weaning process is to liberate patients from the mechanical ventilation. So uh, we'll go to the next uh, key point, which is the terms and abbreviations used mainly uh, in the mechanically ventilated patients. Uh, we hear a lot of the fraction of inspired oxygen. How can we wean off the patient by reducing it gradually, the FiO2, uh, PEEP, which is a positive index respiratory pressure, Spontaneous breathing trial, the SBT. Uh, we will talk a lot about this during this lecture. So remember the abbreviation as well. Uh, CPAP or continuous positive airway pressure at a uh, part of the weaning and mode of weaning as well. Auto PEEP or we call it also sometimes intrinsic PEEP, which uh, many of the extensive COPD patients with advanced disease, they have already uh, an intrinsic PEEP. Uh, related to the dead space for sure. We will talk about this. SIMV mode, the synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. Uh, PSV or pressure support ventilation. Uh, VT or tidal volume, VE or minute volume. Uh, uh, the, the FVT or the rapid shallow breathing index. This is a very important one. We'll have at least two or three slides talking about the rapid shallow breathing index. Uh, uh, so, and, and as well as the uh, uh, PF ratio, we call it sometimes PAO2 or uh, FIO2 or PF ratio uh, as a matter of uh, easier way to uh, pronounce it. Uh, this is basically the partial pressure of the oxygen over the FIO2 ratio. Um, so uh, we know that usually the normal value is 500 or above. And usually we use it to uh, risk stratify the patients in acute lung injury or uh, ARDS. And finally, I to E or inspiratory to expiratory ratio. We will move to the weaning modes. Um, uh, first of all, which is a, a very different weaning modes we have, uh, which are basically three modes, but we will talk more about the spontaneous breathing mode or the SBT, the spontaneous breathing trial, uh, which can be performed using the spontaneous mode on mechanical ventilator or even um, a, a T-piece at the end. And this is, we call it spontaneous breathing trial. Um, second, support. We will go through this uh, in details later on. A third is the pressure support ventilation which in some ventilators like the Bennett 840 uh, model is called spontaneous mode with pressure support. Um, in small instance, uh, some, something called the rapid ventilator discontinuation uh, is a mode of weaning we can use. It can be done actually when the patient is perfectly fine, uh, been like less than 72 hours on mechanical ventilation and off sedation since long time and achieving perfect weaning parameters like the rapid shallow breathing index uh, less than uh, 105 and other parameters. In this case, you can do spontaneous breathing trial for 30 to 120 minutes and then extubate the patient. Uh, then we will talk about weaning parameters in detail. This is just like headlines for the weaning parameters. It's, it's very simple. Like, um, for example, the respiratory rate should be less than 25 breaths per minute, uh, which sure we're talking about the spontaneous respiratory rate. A uh, total volume greater than five mL per kg, uh, MV or minute ventilation, less than 10 liter per minute. And the PF ratio, the one we already talked about, uh, is greater than 200 because when it's less than 300 and then less than 200, that uh, identifies really high risk patients with acute lung injury and eventually um, ARDS. Uh, a very important weaning parameter is the shunt fraction, or we call it the pulmonary shunt fraction. 
it should be less than 20%. So what is basically the pulmonary shunt fraction um, in brief? It describes simply the percentage of the blood that reaches the left side of the heart without picking up oxygen, very simply. Uh, like, for example, the patient who has pulmonary edema or pneumonia, for example, they have increased shunt fraction. Um, excess PEEP, by the way, the, the positive expiratory in, in pressure, uh, uh, and expiratory pressure, the increased airway pressures, um, conditions with severe hypoxia, hypercapnia, all these conditions may contribute as well to an increased pulmonary shunt fraction. So we have to put this in mind. Uh, then these parameters should be fixed at first before starting to wean the patient. Usually we calculate the shunt fraction usually by measuring arterial, mixed, venous, uh, and capillary oxygen content. Uh, last point, which is uh, very valid, uh, and we use it a lot, is the rapid shallow breathing index, or the RSBI, or the um, uh, FVT. It should be less than 105. So um, basically, it, uh, the patient is likely to be weaned from the mechanical ventilation if the rapid shallow breathing index is less than 105. And uh, sure, this parameter is only available on spontaneous mode of weaning. We will explain it in details um, uh, in a dedicated one or two slides later on, uh, after explaining the weaning of uh, the weaning modes and everything, how is to calculate the rapid shallow breathing index, how to uh, postulate it on the mechanical ventilator panel as well. So red alerts, you should really be aware of before starting weaning process. So you know that the weaning process usually may be a little bit of like exhausting or taxing for some patients. So uh, first you have to ensure that the patient doesn't become exhausted or develop signs of respiratory compromise like tachypnea, apprehension, tachycardia, acute severe hypertension and anxiety. So uh, if at any time this occurs or the patient exhibits signs of um, respiratory uh, 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 compromise, that suggests intolerance uh, to the process of weaning, then you have to discontinue the weaning and place him or her back on the ventilatory support or the previous uh, parameter before you started the weaning process. The fourth point is that before uh, the weaning assists meticulously the patient the level of sedation because when the patient is uh, heavily sedated, you have to wait for at least a couple of days till the sedation uh, ward off from the circulation because some patients, especially with the patients who have uh, liver uh, issues, it takes time. Uh, so if there is a residual sedation, this will impede the weaning process and eventually increases the length of time spent um, receiving the mechanical ventilation. The fifth point, you should always avoid the night shift weaning. I'm sure that all the intensivists are aware of this uh, thing because of many complications occurred during the night or after midnight when the weaning process starts. Uh, this is a common mistake and you don't want surprises late night and usually the staff are less in the number and night shifts and the daily rounds that occur during the day will be really more uh, meticulous uh, in assessing the patient's readiness for weaning. And if emergencies occur during the daytime, this will be more manageable in a better way than midnight time regarding the failure of weaning. So the, the preferred method of weaning, like I mentioned before, is the uh, spontaneous, spontaneous breathing trial. Uh, this is basically an attempt to gauge how the patient might do if he or she is uh, immediately removed from the ventilator. And that's why we call it the sink or swim trial. Uh, so either the patient thinks or he swims and makes it out of the mechanical ventilation. So the simplest form of, uh, uh, of it is the TP trial where the patient is disconnected from the ventilator and the endotracheal tube or tracheostomy tube is hooked to a flow by oxygen system, usually from the wall oxygen outlet. This transition from the mechanical ventilator tubes to the new tubing attached to the wall oxygen requires really tremendous uh, uh, extra work from the patient. So the patient has to be aware, he has to be awake and uh, you have to talk to the patient and explain the process exactly. So uh, the key is to withdraw ventilator support while the oxygenation is continued. The same can be done using the CPAP mode while the patient is still connected to the mechanical ventilation. We used to call it long time back electronic weaning. 
So uh, again, the, we talked about the pressure support ventilation in, in brief. Now, um, uh, it's nice to put this illustration of the mechanical ventilator. This is a Bennett 840 model. And uh, uh, like I said before, the pressure support ventilation winning mode can be used with either spontaneous or SIMG mode. So in order to understand what happens here, uh, for example, if you need, uh, if you use, sorry, the pressure support ventilation with spontaneous mode, then all breath are spontaneous and combined with enough pressure support to ensure that each breath generates a reasonable tidal volume, which is a VT. That means that the pressure support lowers the work of breathing for the patient. So it makes him feel better. So it's more comfortable for the patient. So um, uh, you should start usually the pressure support ventilation at around five to 15 centimeter water to augment the tidal volume, like we said, or adequate spontaneous frequency or respiratory rate is achieved. So a uh, third step is uh, to decrease the pressure support gradually and reassess parameters and status of the patient. Uh, fourth step, if the patient tolerates the third step, then you have to check the arterial blood gases and vitals, all the other parameters, and if all uh, within normal, then you should consider extubation at that time. Uh, then comes the SIMV. Um, uh, and we have to know, like I said before, that the SMV mode should be avoided completely as a standalone winning uh, modality. So usually I prefer to start with a high pressure support ventilation uh, to increase the pressure support for the patient uh, when we start the SMV mode. So in, in SMV, the breath are either a mandatory ventilator controlled breath or a spontaneous breath with or without pressure support. But sure, in the winning, we have to start with a pressure support. So the original intent of the SMV was to let the patient's respiratory muscles rest during the mandatory breath and to work during the spontaneous breath. This is uh, the main uh, issue of our uh, uh, explanation for the SMV and how does it work. Uh, in, in fact, I prefer usually not to start the assisted control or the AC mode for the patient on admission uh, when we intubate and we, we admit the patient in the beginning. Um, uh, so it has a lot of issues and uh, drawbacks, the assist control ventilation. Uh, but instead I start SIMV, which is considered a, a weaning mode, but I, I, I started from the scratch uh, with high pressure support for sure. So I see it's an initial mode of ventilation as well as a weaning mode. It's not just a weaning mode. And I usually avoid as much as possible muscle relaxants because uh, they have such deleterious effects on the success of weaning later on. And a lot of papers were published a uh, long time back and recently about the use of muscle relaxants in intensive care. However, for some patients, as for example, the severe ARDS patients, you may need to use muscle relaxants eventually during the mechanical ventilation. Uh, uh, here are signs of intolerance or failure during the weaning process. Um, uh, they are all signs, in fact, to portend the failure of weaning if they are present. Uh, first is increased work of breathing, like nasal flaring, you know all the signs, use of accessory muscles, apprehension, tachypnea, uh, retractions, uh, then crackles or wheezing on auscultation, oxygen saturation, if it's low, uh, change in the mental status if the patient started to uh, be uh, uh, in somnolence or confused or obtunded, uh, you have to recheck your parameters again. Uh, the blood pressure of the patient is hypertensive, uncontrolled hypertensive or severely shocked. These are all alerts uh, that can uh, portend the failure of the weaning. Heart rate as well. Uh, cardiac arrhythmia, if the patient had a rapid AFib, SVT, VT, then you have to deal with this first before you start weaning. Uh, the respiratory rate, and the tidal volume, uh, in addition to the uh, minute volume as well. These are all signs to portend the failure of weaning if they are present. Uh, you cannot start weaning without um, optimizing sedation and limiting the use of paralytics. So usually we say the less is more, so you should really avoid the unnecessary sedation. As sedation protocols have been used um, and have been associated a lot with the shorter duration of uh, mechanical ventilation and are currently recommended by international guidelines. Um, uh, number two tip is um, uh, diaphragm protective ventilation 
to prevent the respiratory muscle complications of mechanical ventilation. So um, prolonged controlled mode ventilation is associated usually with numerous complications, including respiratory muscle uh, fatigue, dysfunction, atrophy, uh, and with poor outcome as well. Uh, high tidal volumes, excessive uh, inspiratory efforts are associated with both lung and diaphragm injuries. The effort-dependent lung injury has been termed patient self-inflicted uh, injury, or PSILI. A third tip is the daily screen of uh, spontaneous breathing trial. Uh, so it's a rule, no inotropes or cardiac support should be um, on the way or ongoing during the weaning process. Uh, the PF ratio uh, should be more than 150. You cannot start weaning a patient if the PF ratio is, uh, is lower than that, because that really signifies for uh, uh, and pretending like expecting a very poor uh, weaning process and uh, eventually failure, uh, because it's associated with uh, uh, significant lung loss and ARDS if the PF ratio is less than 150. Uh, sometimes even we prefer that the PF ratio is more than 200 in order to start the weaning process. Uh, then the FI2, it should be less than 40%. You cannot start weaning a patient when he has like high FI2 uh, requirements, like 60 or 70%, and the PEEP is high, more than 10 centimeter water, for example. Uh, you have to uh, minimize all these parameters before you start the weaning process. Tip number five, uh, choosing the best a spontaneous breathing trial at the bedside is usually not an easy task. So uh, can I really wean and extubate my patient with a low risk of reintubation based on this uh, spontaneous breathing trial? Uh, it's not easy, like we said, and uh, you should really avoid the uh, easy spontaneous breathing trial. So what is the easy spontaneous breathing trial? Uh, it is characterized usually by high assistance, example like high pressure support around seven centimeter water with PEEP, five centimeter water or uh, uh, more than that, and short duration, like 30 minutes. Uh, this usually, we call it the easy trial because there's a high assistance to the patient. So uh, you cannot take an action after that easy trial uh, because it's associated with higher risk of post extubation respiratory failure. So this is the reason why most recent guidelines suggest that the spontaneous breathing trial may be performed if it has a low level of assistance, not a high uh, assistance level, like I showed in the slide here. So, uh, and it, it's what should be a short duration, around 30 minutes, not more. So the pressure support should be uh, around five centimeter water, not seven centimeter water when you start the, the easy spontaneous breathing trial. Uh, the PEEP should be zero and not uh, seven centimeter water when you start the process. And the breathing trial or the spontaneous breathing trial should be around also 30 minutes. It shouldn't be prolonged because that's more fatigue for the patient. Like we said, it will pretend if you follow the easy spontaneous breathing trial, uh, a post extubation respiratory failure um, uh, rate eventually. Tip number five, follow a protocolized weaning strategy. Uh, it means daily and systemic use of a checklist. We will get to the checklist in the next uh, slides. Tip number six, quickly intervene when a spontaneous breathing trial fails. Because you may unmask actually other several undiagnosed conditions with positive pressure that should be addressed and treated before the next trial. Tip number seven, difficult to wean patients make up actually around 20% of the mechanically ventilated uh, critically ill population, this is a high rate, 20%. So uh, the risk factors are being, uh, as I show here, elderly patients, uh, if they have cardiopulmonary comorbidities, the female sex uh, uh, being affected by uh, cardiopulmonary comorbidities and, and the duration of the ventilation usually more than seven days, uh, if there are copious secretions and uh, improper or um, uh, inadequate uh, chest physiotherapy and the spirometry. So uh, that was uh, regarding the difficult to wean patient. So tip number eight, uh, do you know that 10 to 5% of the patients uh, will need to be reintubated within 48 to 72 hours post extubation? That's really a large number, 10 to 15%. Uh, this is why post extubation respiratory support is really vital. So, um, you have the standard oxygen therapy in easy to wean patients. 
Uh, this should be used basically in an, um, uh, patients who doesn't have uh, extubation failure risk factors, like we, we mentioned before. Uh, on the other hand, in high-risk patients, the combination of high-dose non-invasive intubation at least 12 hours per day for 40 hours per extubation with high-flow nasal oxygen is associated with um, a less reintubation rate uh, if we compared it with um, high-flow nasal oxygen alone. And the last tip, uh, the tracheostomy. Some patients we have to consider late tracheostomy, more than 10 days of mechanical ventilation. And you know the guidelines that usually you should uh, consider tracheostomy after seven days of mechanical ventilation. But there are some eligible patients we should consider for late tracheostomy. Uh, those uh, who may, for example, uh, benefit uh, uh, from gradual weaning and constant airway mucus plugging control. Uh, patients deemed to be extubated as soon for reversible cause, like for example, recovered cardiogenic shock with normal other parameters, or uh, unwillingness of the patient or the relatives, or the patient or the relatives wish themselves. We will get now to the weaning assessment. Here's the checklist of weaning assessment. Uh, we talked about these parameters before, but you know that the weaning, uh, weaning readiness is determined by assessment of the patient's stability, resolution of the reason, for mechanical ventilation and achievement of selected weaning criteria goal. For example, in, in this uh, box number one, uh, you, can, you can see here that uh, basically we will have three boxes. This is the first one. It describes the standard weaning criteria, like negative inspirator pressure shall be less than minus 20 to minus 30 centimeters of water, uh, spontaneous study of volume more than five mil per kg, uh, vital capacity is quite good enough, um, FI2 should be less than 40 to 50 percent. Sorry. Um, the minute ventilation should be less than 10 liter per minute, and the PEEP should be less than 5 to 8 centimeter water. Then we'll get to the box two, and uh, I've already told you in advance that we need to talk more about the rapid shallow breathing index. Uh, so this describes the RSBI or the uh, uh, F. Uh, v tidal volume, the frequency over the tidal volume of the patient. This is basically done only in their sp spontaneous breathing uh, effort, not on the other modes. So um, how can we calculate it? We, we said before that this ratio should be less than 105 uh, to portend the weaning success. If it's more than 105, and some uh, studies say that in the elderly, it's accepted to be till 130. Uh, so it, if it's exceed that level, that it portends really weaning failure. Let's suppose that um, respiratory rate is 40 breaths per minute, and the tidal volume achieved by the patient is 200 ml, which is low. So uh, we will use the liters, not the milliliters. So we will say 0.2 liters. This is the tidal volume of the patient. So if you do the mass and you uh, divide the frequency over the tidal volume, the rapid shallow breathing index will be 200, which is very high and that portends failure of the weaning. So it's a simple math. Usually mo mo most ventilators, at least the new ventilators, you can get this uh, math automatically calculated. You don't have to do the math at all. Uh, there's a screen where you get the parameter, the curves, everything, and you will get the uh, RBSI, or the frequency over the tidal volume, uh, automatic. So you don't have to calculate it. Uh, so we have as well to, uh, to be attentive to other clinical factors during the weaning assessment, before initiating the weaning trials. Most predictors focus usually on the pulmonary specific factors, but there's a lot of other factors as well. Uh, for the clinical tools, there's something called Burns Weaning Assessment Program. This is actually box number three. So it ensures uh, uh, systemic attention to these factors and it may help ensure as well the good outcomes if you follow this checklist. It's, it's a very large checklist. We don't have to go every single point uh, separately. Um, uh, that will take much time, but just put it in mind to revise it later. It's a nice checklist to keep it in the ICU uh, for the weaning assessment before you go for the weaning um, uh, final decision. So uh, like I said, it's a long checklist. You can uh, see that it includes vitals. It includes hemodynamics. It includes hematocrit value, uh, hydration of the patient, nourishment, albumin level, electrolytes if there's hyper or hypokalemia or hypocalcemia any electrolyte derangement, if the patient had adequate sleep or he has insomnia because that portends also failure of the weaning. Uh, 
uh, the appropriate level of anxiety, absence of any bowel uh, problems like constipation or diarrhea, uh, breathing uh, pattern, residual chest infection, pain control, it's many things. Uh, just keep a copy of it, it's, it's nice to help. And by the time you will get trained to it, you will just manage to finish it very fast before you, you, you really get a glimpse or uh, uh, a good idea of uh, this patient will be winnable or not. Uh, this is a continuum of the box three. You can see that it includes even uh, parameters on strength, endurance of the ventilation, in addition to ABG analysis of the, of the patient. Uh, so finally, the score is calculating. This score, I mean, uh, uh, you have to divide the number of yes uh, ahead of this 26 points by 26. So when divide the number of yes by 26, whenever score is higher, it favors increased weaning success rate. If the uh, score is low, like for example, five or six, that portends winning failure. Uh, more of the winning parameters we talked about already. Uh, we already had uh, been through this. So uh, uh, we talked about the PF ratio, which we uh, uh, managed to uh, abbreviate it better in that uh, term, PF ratio instead of PAO2 over FI2 ratio. I'm sure you're all aware of its significance and its correlation uh, with the mortality rates in the ARDS patient. You can, you can tell here that uh, uh, the mortality increases uh, further much, around 45% when the ARDS is severe and the PF ratio is less than 100. When it's over 200 or 300, that uh, portends a lower level of acute lung injury and the mortality rate is lower, but still high for sure. So, um, you have to be careful because you cannot use this PF ratio when the PaCO2 or the partial pressure of uh, uh, carbon dioxide is high or there is suspected a high pulmonary shunt since it will not really reflect uh, the correct values. So avoid these uh, two parameters to um, uh, calculate the PF ratio if you have the shunt, if it's high, and if the PaCO2 is high. Um, there are two slides which portends as well difficulty in waning process, like uh, the drive to breathe, the central drive. If, for example, patient's still on sedatives and it's uh, not yet worrying of the circulation and he's drowsy, that portends difficult waning. This is regarding the central drive. Uh, if the patient is COB and he has a loss of hypoxic drive, if there's metabolic alkalosis uh, due to hypokalemia, for example, uh, neuromuscular disorders like guillain barre syndrome, Mycenae gravis, uh, critical care myopathy, electrolyte derangements, uh, this all portends difficult weaning or weaning failure, uh, as well as the increased resistance of respiratory uh, tract like bronchospasm, uh, residual infection, thick secretions, uh, severe pneumonia, unrecovered pulmonary edema, uh, a patient who has very high intrinsic PEEP or auto PEEP, uh, large pleural effusion, which we will get through uh, uh, in the live cases and how this can portend the uh, we need failure. So these are the last part of the lecture. Uh, it's basically life cases with failed weaning. Uh, for example, you can see this patient. It's, an, uh, it's a demo for uh, a patient who has severe loss of aeration. There's a lot of coalescent B lines uh, reflected from the pleural line, and they are multiple all over the lung field. Uh, they are regularly spaced with a limited portion of sector. So this basically uh, portend weaning failure because you can see that patients still have interstitial pulmonary edema or uh, cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So uh, you cannot do an ultrasound uh, on the lung for this patient during mechanical ventilation and suggest or take a decision immediately that you should wean this patient. You have to manage first uh, treating the pulmonary edema. So uh, this is uh, very interesting. Uh, we had this slide as well uh, yesterday during the lung ultrasound um, uh, uh, lecture. I'm repeating it here because that patient actually he has a total lung loss, as you can see, with significant lung consolidation. This patient had a COVID-19 pneumonia. Uh, you can see that the lung is completely destroyed. This finger-like projections uh, in the lung tissue. And uh, uh, this patient is mechanically ventilated. He has a large free flowing pleural effusion with extensive hypoechogenic areas. So can really, we really wean this patient of the mechanical ventilation or we still have to wait? Sure, this patient cannot be weaned yet. This is a huge amount of uh, pleural effusion. 
uh, by the way, for illustration only, uh, this is the liver, this is the diaphragmatic edge, this is the lung itself with atelectasis, severe lung loss, this is effusion, and this area over here, this glistening, uh, brightening uh, bar, this is actually the vertebral column, uh, the spine. When you, when you have pleural effusion and you scan the patient, you can really see the thoracic spine uh, on the back. So this is a reflection of it. Uh, again, you can appreciate here that uh, there are cracked and irregular, irregular pleural line with frequent B lines on both lungs. This is a patient with severe pneumonia. Um, uh, I believe whoever attended yesterday's lecture also can uh, uh, appreciate uh, how this patient is in severe pneumonia and uh, there's significant lung tissue damage from the lung ultrasound. Like we said, cracked, irregular, pleural line and uh, frequent B lines uh, reflected through the whole lung field. Uh, that's a patient with uh, a massive right lung collapse, as you can see through the chest X-ray. There's a huge amount of pleural effusion, so uh, it should be drained first. You cannot also wean this patient because it will probably 100% a failed weaning trial. That patient had a past history of mechanical valve prosthesis, as you can see here. So drainage is a priority before the weaning trial. So uh, this is a very important slide. And this is an example of how weaning can fail in patients with cardiogenic or septic shock. So as you can see from this curve, that the mortality rate increases dramatically when vasopressor requirements increase uh, as well. So you can see from the curve that if norepinephrine dose is more, more than 0 0.3 over here, if it's more than 0 0.3 uh, mic per kg per minute, uh, actually, the in-hospital mortality approaches almost 40%. And if very high rate of infusion, more than one mic per kg per minute, the mortality rate even increases up to 80 or 85%. So being on high dose of vasopressors predicts uh, a failed weaning process. You have to, to remember this very well. And at this point, you cannot really think of starting the weaning process of mechanical ventilator unless you wean the patient first of uh, the vasopressors. Uh, this is very interesting as well. Uh, this is like a life patient as well, and that patient is on mechanical ventilation. Uh, you can see that from the echo, a short axis, uh, uh, an LV short axis uh, view that uh, there is severe LV dysfunction and the patient is uh, uh, having already a mechanical complication on the other side. This is a severe grade four mitral regurge. Uh, which uh, likely due to ruptured cordy tendon. Uh, that patient for sure will uh, fail the weaning if started prematurely before stabilizing the cardiac status. That means he has to be on the inotropes. Uh, uh, cardiac function should be stabilized first before we start the weaning process. Um, another patient is the patient who had cardiac arrhythmia. You should also avoid the weaning in the setting of cardiac arrhythmia. Either it is a tachy or a bradyarrhythmia. Uh, first, control the insistent arrhythmia by treating the cause, and then you should start the weaning process. So, all the previous causes can be reasons for failure of weaning. And these are possible clinical criteria related to sp spontaneous breathing trial failure, specifically. Like when the PO2 less than 60 millimeter mercury, or if it was more than 50% during the SBT failure, uh, sorry, the SBT trial. Uh, saturation less than 90% on higher FAO2, more than 50%. Uh, when the CO2 is more than 50 millimeter mercury, um, when the pH is less than 7.3, or the patient is quite acidotic, that portends also a failure of spontaneous breathing trial. Um, uh, when you have a, a, a frequency over the target volume, or we talked about it, the rapid trial of breathing index, uh, more than 100 or 105, uh, that portend also failure of the weaning. When the respiratory rate is more than 35 breaths per minute, when the heart rate is very high or still very low as well, like patient who had heart block. Uh, when the, the patient is an uh, uncontrolled hypertensive patient and you cannot still control it, you cannot start weaning, or the patient is shocked, still you cannot uh, start the weaning process. So these are all possible clinical criteria uh, related to the spontaneous breathing trial failure. Um, Finally, here is a simple algorithm for discontinuation of mechanical ventilation. So 
um, you should revise first the reason for the ventilation, if it's improved or resolved or not. You should do daily screening of respiratory function, like the PF ratio, PEEP, um, uh, if there's adequate cough reflex, uh, the rapid shell breathing index uh, during this continuous trial, is it uh, lower than 100 or uh, higher than 100? And no vasopressors or sedatives. Um, if yes, then you should go to the next step, which is this continuous breathing trial. Like we said, we should make it short, 30 minutes, not more. Uh, you can do it with the TPs, you can do it with the CPAP, like the electronic weaning, or uh, low-level pressure support. So uh, if the patient here is poorly tolerated, then uh, you have to do gradual weaning, daily TPs trials, or pressure support ventilation. However, if the patient is well tolerated, then you can go for extubation. And from the beginning, if you found that the patient is still not uh, achieving this parameter, then you have to continue ventilation and uh, postpone the, the spontaneous breathing trial. So after extubation, uh, there's a lot of factors we mentioned about the respiratory failure post extubation. So uh, if the patient has failure of uh, weaning, consider trial of non-invasive before you re-intubate because usually the re-intubation portends also uh, poor prognosis. So you should try first a CPAP or non-invasive ventilation for around two hours if the patient has cardiogenic edema or COPD. Uh, however, if not responding, then you should intubate uh, immediately, if appropriate. Uh, finally, the comments and the take-home message. So, uh, um, all patients receiving letter support should be assessed daily for their suitability of weaning. Um, this may involve uh, meeting several preconditions and then spontaneous breathing trial. Um, if unsuccessful, weaning should be attempted using either pressure support, ventilation, or daily spontaneous breathing trial of increasing duration. Uh, uh, Third um, uh, comment is a tracheostomy. We, we talked about this, that it could be helpful in patients who are difficult to wean. However, you can, you can postpone it more than 10 days in specific patients like we talked uh, before about. Uh, it's good to mention as well that over 95% of the patients should be weanable in this way. A few patients per year may need to refer to a long-term uh, weaning unit. Thank you very much um, for your attention. I do really appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Fadi. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, let's see if we have any questions over here. Uh, they mentioned uh, you have given them already some useful information today oh, morning, cool. which Great. is good. Alhamdulillah. I'm happy for that. And we have good numbers attending as well. Wonderful. Which is good on a Friday afternoon. Uh, I have a question. Oh, okay, go, hi, Dr. Vinay, I, go ahead, please. Can I ask Good, good to see you. Yeah, good to see you as well, Dr. Fadi. Great presentation, Thank very Thank clear you. and concise. Really appreciate it. Uh, Thank you. I do lung ultrasound or need-based, but I, I have one problem with it in the sense that I'm not able to differentiate whether it's a hydrostatic or a non-hydrostatic pulmonary edema. And secondly, the timeline of fluid accumulation, whether it is acute or chronic, then I need to resolve, like go through the other modalities like eco. Can you tell me some tips and tricks as to your experience? How do you resolve this issue? Yeah, it's, it's a bit confusing sometimes. I even mentioned yesterday in the lecture that sometimes it, for clinicians, it's a bit confusing if you don't have a really good clinical background of the patient. I mean, you have the patient, you know the disease, you know the lab workup, you know if the patient is in sepsis or pneumonia or uh, if this kind of B lines you are seeing that this is really inflammatory or is it uh, interstitial edema. But the thing that really helps a lot, if you look at the plural line that we, we, we talked about today and yesterday as well, because the plural line should be really... Um, uh, clean, with no fissures, with no cracks. It should be thick and white, shining in, in your screen in the beginning of the uh, screen up in the top. And the B-line should be reflected coalescently and, and quite uniformly uh, from the B-line, from the plural line, sorry. And the thing that if you couldn't find also subplural consolidations, for example, or any signs of infection or pneumonia, that means that basically according short to the clinical scenario, that would be more like a cardiogenic pulmonary edema. However, the, B, the plural line, if it's really uh, regular and cracked with a lot of fissures, subplural consolidations, 
and the patient shows signs of uh, pneumonia, like uh, uh, you had already a CT, you had an X-ray and you're suspecting some pneumonia from the clinical picture, patient's fever, CRP, Procal, or other inflammatory markers are high, then you should uh, use this as well as in favor of the uh, uh, infection, not not the pulmonary edema or the cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So I think it's that it's some kind of, some kind of have like you have to use also your clinical uh, scenario, not just the lung ultrasound. Because in right. some occasions, I can tell you this by experience, it's a little bit confusing also. Yeah, it's easy to learn but a little confusing to interpret. Exactly. Yeah. True. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Doctor Fadi, we have one question. If you can open your Q and A box, please. Sure. How we will calculate tidal volume in case with TPS trial to measure the F uh, the the rapid shallow breathing index ratio and thanks. Okay, so uh, the thing that we cannot actually calculate the rapid shallow breathing index when we have a TPS trial uh, because the thing that this is a spontaneous breathing trial but not on spontaneous smoke because we said that you can only calculate the rapid shallow breathing index when you have. Uh, 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 you have determined the tidal volume, which he cannot determine while the patient is breathing completely spontaneously. There is no pressure support. He's away from the ventilator, just attach it to the oxygen to, for the TP. So the thing that if he's not on the ventilator, you cannot calculate the uh, rapid shallow breathing index. However, if you need to calculate it, it's very easy because you can just uh, put the patient back on the spontaneous mode and raise the pressure support on the mechanical ventilator. And now you can see the how is the rapid shallow breathing index. And then try to wean gradually, remove the pressure support and the PEEP and keep the patient still on the ventilator. Calculate the rapid sh shallow breathing index from the ventilator parameters. And then when you put the patient on the TPS trial, uh, just on the oxygen away from the ventilator, at least you have a very good uh, glimpse on how the patient doing clinically. Because if the patient's doing fine, you already know the parameters from the ventilator just before attaching to a TPS. But if the patient is tachypneic, started to, uh, to show signs that he's relying very much on the pressure support of the spontaneous mode and the PEEP, then you have to bring him back and go back to the other uh, mode of uh, uh, pre-weaning, which is the spontaneous mode. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Thank you. Fed. Thank you. I think that was a good start for our uh, afternoon session today. Uh, Dr. Shaima, you want to say anything? Uh, I wish uh, to thank you, Dr. Fadi, for his time and effort on the uh, the good luck today. So thanks a lot, Dr. Shaima. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fadi. Thank you, Dr. Uh, for your time today, inshallah, you will join us in another workshop in the future, inshallah. Inshallah, I will. I will be honored. Okay. My we pleasure. Are, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, dear attendees, in the, this uh, afternoon session, uh, let me welcome again our dear friend, uh, uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Shaima Asayek, who is a senior cardiologist at Shifa Al Jazeera Medical Center here in the Kingdom of Bahrain. And Dr. Shaima is going to continue uh, her part two of uh, uh, CVP pressure from yesterday's. Uh, the platform is yours, Dr. Shaima. Thank you, Dr. Imam, for your uh, kind introduction. Today, uh, we will uh, talk about the uh, second part of CVP. Uh, I'll make concentrate on the central venous pulsation uh, and the clinical examination. Uh, today, I'll uh, start with neck vein anatomy. Uh, I told you yesterday, dear colleagues, about the neck vein anatomy, it is uh, very important to know before examining this patient, right and the left external jugular vein, and then unite with right and the left jugular, internal jugular vein, then they will drain to the left and right subclavian veins, then it will uh, drain to left and right uh, preticephalic vein, then will drain to superior vena cava, then right atrium, then right side of the heart. This is a, a clinical examination to jugular venous pulsation and its importance as a non-invasive method to uh, detect the jugular venous pressure. So from neck examination, as we see here, we put the patient in 45 degrees. Then we uh, here will see the right atrium and the RV. Uh, it is a distance about five centimeters till the manipulative sternoid. 
then we will see the continuation of internal jugular vein, right? Internal jugular vein, it's about three centimeters. So we can calculate that the uh, jugular venous pressure is about eight centimeter water. And this is the normal uh, jugular venous pressure. And we will correspond it to waves A, C, V, and the two negative waves to the uh, heart sounds and to the EKG QRS complex T wave. What is the jugular venous pulsation? Defined as oscillating top of vertical column of the blood in the right internal jugular veins that reflect pressure, changes in the right atrium in cardiac cycle. So it is important to know the pressure via the vertical height of oscillating column of the blood. This is the uh, examining position of the patient, 45 degree uh, sleeping. And the, here the uh, right atrium will be in the zero point level in the manipulum sternae level. Then it will continue to right internal jugular vein, then to the uh, from superior vein cava to right internal jugular vein column. Why internal jugular vein we examining through with the pressure? Because it is direct course to the right atrium and closer to the right atrium and no valves. So external jugular vein prevent the transmission of right atrial pressure because it contains valves. So better for us is internal jugular vein, not external jugular vein. Here, this is the anatomy again. We see here the right internal jugular vein and this is the external jugular vein. The right internal jugular vein, it is continuous as we see here to the right atrium. So uh, it is very malleable to us and easy to predict the central venous pressure through it. Why right internal jugular vein again? It is extended in almost a straight line to the superior vena cava and thus feathering transmission of the hemodynamic changes from the right atrium. Uh, but the left innominent vein, as we see here, this is the left innominent vein. It is not in the straight line and maybe can get or compressed between a vertical arch and sternum by either lated aorta or by an aneurysm. So how we can do the differentiation between the venous pulse and the carotid pulse during examination? Venous pulsation more laterally, carotid pulse is more medially. Venous pulsation wavy and ambulant. The carotid is falciform and uh, presky. The venous pulsation decreases with inspiration and increase in the supine position. But carotid pulsation, no change in the pulsation nor inspiration. Also, the venous pulsation increased with abdominal pressure, but carotid pulsation, no change. Venous pulsation double peaked, carotid pulsation single peaked. The uh, venous pulsation, we can obliterate it by pressure. Carotid pulsation cannot be obliterated. The, uh, and the venous pulsation visible better to be seen by the eye, but carotid pulsation better to be palpated by fingers. Uh, the venous pulsation better to be viewed from the end of the bed foot of the patient. How we uh, do the examination? The patient will lie comfortable during the examination and the clothing should be removed from the neck and the upper thorax. Patient recline to the 45 degree and the neck should then be sharply flexed. Examine effectively by shining a light torch tangential across the neck. There shouldn't be any tight pants around the abdomen. How we can observe level of the venous pressure and the type of the venous pattern of the waves. Uh, the level of the venous pressure using centimeter ruler and measure the vertical distance between the angle of flows, and the highest level of the jugular vein pulsation. The upper limit of normal is four centimeter from the sternal angle and at five centimeter of the measurement of central venous pressure since the right atrium pressure is below five centimeter sternal angle. And the normal CVV, it is ranging less than eight or nine centimeter water. This is the, uh, uh, another uh, drawing for this point, it is something five centimeter below the manipulum Mr. Noy, then you can measure the ruler here. 
And this is the waves we can see uh, by the examination. As we told yesterday, uh, A and C and B are the three positive waves. And we have X and Y negative waves. This is, can be seen by the central venous pressure monitoring as we did yesterday by uh, uh, invasive catheterization. And now we can see them by uh, the neck examination. The normal jugular venous pressure reflect basic pressure, uh, physic pressure changes in the right atrium and the consist of three positive waves, A and C and B, and two negative uh, waves, uh, X and Y. Simultaneously, palpation of the left carotid artery, it will aid for the examiner to relating the venous pulsation to the timing of the cardiac cycle. Now I uh, studied again one, uh, one wave by the one wave and I'll say what is the abnormalities for each one, okay, to be easier for us. A wave, it is the venous distension due to right atrial contraction. It is a retrograde blood flow into the superior vena cava and internal jugular vein and the synchronous with S1 and follow the B wave on ECG and preceded by the carotid pulsation. So what is the abnormalities we will see in the A-wave? A-wave, we can see here uh, abnormalities. It may be increased. Increased, it will be more peaked than the normal. In uh, which uh, diseases, tricuspid stenosis, right heart failure, pulmonary stenosis, and pulmonary arterial hypertension. And it may be canon. Canon, it is more giant. It is uh, seen in the complete heart clock or when ventricular tachycardia or pacing or junctional rhythm. It may be absent. We will not see in the uh, graph C or B uh, directly, no A wave in atrial fibrillation. Okay, we will now go to the V wave. V wave, it is the rising in the right atrial pressure as we told V, V venous return. It means the blood flow into the right atrium during ventricular systole, well, when the tricuspid valve is shut, it means closed. The synchronous with the carotid pulsation, it is with the carotid pulsation, and they begin in early systole and peak after S2, and ends in early diastole. What is the abnormalities we can see in V wave? Elevated V-wave, we can see in tricuspid regurgitation because we will increase the volume to the right atrium, right ventricular failure, right restrictive cardiomyopathy and poor pulmonal. Tricuspid regurgitation, as we see here, it is very important disease in cardiology and we here see here absent X descent and the regurgitant wave has a rounded contour, the B wave and sustained peak followed by a rapid deep descent to the Y and the amplitude of V increases with inspiration and the post subtle motion you loop with each heartbeat. And A wave and B wave may be equal, okay? It is in the same level in which disease in atrial septal defect, ESD, because it is indicating large left to right chunk with pulmonary arterial hypertension and the increasing to the uh, venous, return to the left side. Uh, this is A wave and B wave. And then we will complete our demonstration to the waves. X descent is due to atrial relaxation and X dash is descent of the floor of the right atrium during right ventricular systole and begin during systole and ends before S2. C wave occur simultaneously with the carotid pulsation and are affected by carotid pulsation. Maybe you confuse with carotid pulsation. Pulging of the tricuspid valve into the right atrium during the contractions. It is the ventricular uh, C cusp, cusp bulging, okay? And this is the V wave we said, then why descent? Why descent? It is due to decline in the right atrial pressure when the tricuspid valve re reopen and following the bottom of the wide descent and before beginning of the A wave is a period of relatively slow filling of the ventricle and the diastasis period and A wave term it the H wave as we see here. And this is a corresponding of the neck veins and heart sound and the carotid pulsation and ECG. As we see here, A wave, for example, it is with before S1 and on the P wave of, yeah, of the QRS complex, 
V wave here, uh, it will be corresponding to S2 and on the T wave of the ECG. This is uh, again the slide for identifying waveform exit descent occur just prior to the S2 uh, during systole, while wide descent occur after S2 uh, during diastole. Normally, exit descent is more prominent than the wide descent. Wide descent is only sometimes seen during diastole, and descent are better seen than the positive waves. Uh, a wave occurred just before S1, as I told, uh, or corroded pulsation has a sharp rise and fall. B wave is just after arterial pulse and has a slower uh, undulating pattern. C wave is never seen normally because it is corresponding to the carotid and it is uh, corresponding with ventricular system. Abnormality of GVP also for uh, decreasing GVP if we said the, the GVP is low. Okay, how, uh, what is the abnormality? Maybe hypovolemia and uh, dehydrated. Elevated GVP may be uh, in these diseases. Uh, first of all, is uh, intravascular volume overload, like right ventricular infarction, uh, left ventricular uh, heart failure, myocardial infarction, valvular heart disease, cardiomyopathies, endocrine stress, pericarditis, and pericardial effusion with tamponade. And we will differentiate between these two diseases as it is very important in, uh, many, uh, in the main veins examination. As we see here also why descent, it is uh, may be prominent. It means uh, 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 sharp descent in constrict pericarditis, tricuspid regurgitation, AST, and absent uh, Y descent in uh, cardiac tamponade, RV, infarction, restrictive cardiomyopathy. And the slow, it means uh, shallow Y descent, tricuspid stenosis, right atrium exoma. This is the uh, X-ray showing a shell around the heart. It is called constrictive pericarditis. It makes for us, uh, for us a sign, a very important sign. It is a question for all of us in examinations and very important to the clinic for the patient, Frederick sign. It is exaggerated ex wave or diastolic collapse of the neck veins from uh, the constrictive pericarditis. This is the shape of the wave in the constrictive pericarditis. We will see here M-shaped contour, prominent X descent and Y descent. This is the Frederick sign. Y descent is prominent as ventricular filling is unimpeded during early diastole because it, you, you like uh, wearing a very tight coat around the heart. This is, uh, is interrupted by a rapid raise in pressure as the filling is impeded by the constrictive pericardium. The ventricular pressure curve exhibits square root sign, and this is seen also by the, uh, uh, the catheter in the pulmonary artery catheterization. Here's a uh, small comparison between constriction versus the uh, tamponade. How to differentiate between constrictive pericarditis and tamponade? Tamponade uh, and the constriction, we will see low cardiac output state and GVP uh, and the jugular venous distension and uh, uh, tamponade is no cosmo sign, but constriction there is cosmo sign. And I'll explain what is a cosmo sign. It is the uh, opposite of the normal. It means the neck veins will not decrease during inspiration. Equalization of the diastolic pressure in both. It, what is the meaning of equalization of the diastolic pressure? It means that all the chambers, right, both atria and both ventricles are equal in pressure by the cath. Right atria uh, planted wide descent, here rapid wide descent. Here, here uh, tamponade decrease heart sound because there is a gap between the chest wall and the heart from the fluid around the heart. Constriction in this pericardial knock, we can hear. This is the case of tamponating by echo, and this is an illustration between normal CVP and CVP in cardiac tamponade. We will see here is a deep white descent. And this is a comparison between the normal and tamponade and the construction. As we see here in this uh, uh, diagram, uh, cosmo sign is present in construction pericarditis, but not in tamponade and right atrial pressure tracing. There is absent Y, uh, but there is prominent X. Here it is prominent both Y and X descent and the equalization of the heart both are equalized in heart pressures and square root sign we will see in constriction pericarditis not tamponade and pulses paradoxes we will see in tamponade not in the constriction in most cases. 
there is also sign very important during examinations and exams is called abdominal jugular reflux. It is a positive when JVP is increased after 10 seconds of abdominal pressure, followed by a rapid drop in pressure of four centimeter on release of compression. Uh, most common causes of positive this test, we will compress on the abdomen of the patient and we will uh, observe the neck vein. Most of our common positive tests borderline elevation of the JVP because silent TR, latent rheumatic heart failure, uh, right heart failure, and false positive in fluid overload and false negative in superior and inferior vena cava obstruction in Bacchiari syndrome. As we know, uh, it is coagulopathy in both vena cava. Uh, positive tests imply superior vena cava and inferior vena cava are patent. What is a positive sign? It is failure to decline, decrease in the GVP during inspiration. Uh, this is seen in constrictive pericarditis and severe right heart failure, restri restrictive cardiomyopathy, and tricuspid stenosis. This slide, the small slides, I uh, put it here to know the pressure waves uh, on the monitor by the CVP, as I explained yesterday in the first part. Uh, this is the, sh the shape of P wave in the QRS, and this is in diastole, and we can see here A wave on the monitor. Okay, here QRS wave on the ECG, and this, this is the early diastole, and we can see here C wave by the monitor. But means, as someone questioned me yesterday, C wave can be seen uh, in the neck examination. No, not seen, but we can see on the monitor. Here also T, uh, this is the T wave late systole, and we will see the B wave on the monitor. This is the diastole and early diastole, and we will see the wide descent. Thank you. And uh, Ahmed will share for us a small video about the neck uh, vein examination and CVP waves. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Dr. Shaima, for your presentation. Uh, we, let me see if we have any questions. Uh, Can we take the question after the three minute uh, uh, video, small video? Please. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you can play this video. The video is with you, uh, Dr. Shaima. No, with Ahmed. Yeah, just one minute we will share, just within one minute. Uh, sorry, friends, we just had uh, technical issues. We are uploading the video now. Sorry for uh, the wait. Jugular veins act as a column of blood in which the CVP, the central venous pressure, or CVP, 
is the pressure within the thoracic vena cava just before the right atrium. The superior vena cava and the connecting jugular veins act as a column of blood in which the CVP can be approximated by determining the jugular venous pressure. This is done by measuring the elevation of the neck veins above the sternal angle and correlating it to the height of the blood column in centimeters of water. The right-sided internal jugular vein is best for conducting this procedure since it is directly connected to the right atrium. The exam can also be performed on the external jugular veins, but they often branch at right angles which can interfere with the test results. However, in this video, the external veins are used to perform the examination since their superficial course and good visibility allow for the best demonstration of the technique. In the beginning, the patient should be recumbent with the head turned slightly to the left. The jugular veins are now at the same level as the right atrium and should be significantly distended under physiological conditions. The jugular vein presents with a regular pulse featuring a twin peak. The internal jugular vein's pulsations are not readily observable since it lies deeper within the neck. Its pulsation, though weak, can be observed just ventromedial to the external jugular vein. The CVP, or the height of the blood column above the right atrium, can now be estimated by slowly raising the patient's upper body by about 30 to 45 degrees. As soon as the distension of the jugular vein starts to decrease, halt the movement of the patient's upper body and locate the most cranial point at which the jugular vein is still distended. The vein now functions as a manometer that represents the CVP. Draw an imagined horizontal line towards the sternum, starting at the most cranial point at which the vein is still distended. Since the sternal angle lies about 5 centimeters above the level of the right atrium, add those 5 centimeters to the measured distance. This sum roughly represents the patient's CVP, measured in centimeters of water. This patient has a CVP of about 7 centimeters of water, which is within the reference range of 4 to 10 centimeters of water. If the sum is greater than 10 centimeters, the CVP is considered too high, as seen in heart failure, hypervolemia, or pulmonary embolism. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Shaima. There is one question for you, doctor, if you want to open your Q&A box. Okay, which waves can be differentiated by uh, NIC examination, doctor, please? We can differentiate the A wave and B wave. Okay. Do you want to comment anything on the video, Dr. Shaima? Nothing, it is a, a summary for what we said. Okay. Yeah, it showed very well how to measure the JVP. Yes. But nice. Okay, Dr. Shaima, you want, uh, we have two speakers now for the next session. Uh, okay. Also, our colleagues from yesterday as well, Dr. Islam Shihata and Dr. Khadija Hamid. Uh, who will I introduce uh, both of them uh, to the next session. It will be so uh, interesting and uh, it is uh, uh, monitoring the fluid responsiveness with Dr. Khadija Hamid, uh, Chef Resident Anesthesia and ICU PDF uh, Hospital Bahrain. And we'll co-share co with her in this session, Dr. Uh, Islam Shahata after that about hypotension predictive index device in ICU. So uh, join Dr. Khadija, then Dr. Islam. Welcome. Thank you. Um, can you see my presentation? Yes, Dr. Khadija, but put it in a uh, in, uh, uh, slide there, uh, yeah. Okay. Yes, now. Okay. Thank you. Bismillah.
Ahmad Rahim, uh, Assalamu alaikum, welcome back everyone. Uh, it's nice to uh, see you all again. Uh, I know it's maybe uh, you you may be overwhelmed a little bit, a lot of uh, information. Uh, maybe some some of you it's uh, it's a quick review and update. So just bear with us. Uh, hopefully you will gain the most out of it. So uh, actually this was a last minute thing. Uh, I thought about uh, presenting uh, or talking about fluid responsiveness because it's a really, really uh, important topic and there is a lot of debate about it and a lot of updates, okay? Uh, so what we will do is in the next half an hour, inshallah, we'll talk about uh, the incidence of patients who uh, fail to fluid, uh, to fluid boluses. Uh, how common is it? How can we avoid that? And what are the controversies in, uh, in giving fluid? How should we give it? Okay, and we'll also uh, talk about the value of measuring uh, the fluid response uh, according to the, the, the signs and or the, from the parameters that we're going to see. So uh, the most important, uh, the first message that uh, you have to keep in mind is that uh, always consider uh, fluids as a drug, okay? So it's not something uh, something easy and people just, just take, it, take it for granted and just tell the patient, any patient, okay, just give him fluid and let's see what he does. Uh, some patients, they cannot tolerate uh, the, the, either the type or the amount of fluid that you are giving and it can cause a lot of problems, which we will see later on. Okay, so usually when do, we, when do we decide to give fluid to patients? Patients who are having any signs of hemodynamic instability or signs of hypoperfusion. So this is all in, as per your clinical sense. So when you see the patient has uh, signs of hypoperfusion in the terms of, for example, mottled skin, uh, hypotension, oliguria, high lactate, this all indicates to you that this patient may be dry, okay? Uh, the other thing is that we, we do a test and we check the fluid response uh, or the volume responsiveness of this patient because not all of them will respond to fluid and we're going to talk about this uh, in detail. And uh, the other thing is that you want to limit, you al always keep in mind that you want to limit the risk of fluid overload. So you have to use it very, very cautiously, okay? Now, there are a lot of studies looking at this, and they discovered that actually 50% of patients who are getting fluid, they were not, uh, it was not indicated, and they actually didn't respond to this fluid. So it's like a 50-50 thing. So you have to be very, very careful. And especially in septic patients, always keep in mind uh, septic shock patients or septic patients, uh, they have diastolic dysfunction. So their heart is not normal. They will not tolerate the normal amount that the healthy uh, patients can tolerate, okay? So uh, this is a quote, actually, I got it from uh, one of the pioneers in, uh, who looked at uh, fluid resuscitation and fluid responsiveness. And if you remember last uh, yesterday's lecture about uh, septic shock and the cervical sepsis campaign guidelines, where they used uh, the, the, ba the, the basic uh, principle was early goal-directed therapy, which we mentioned was uh, by Emmanuel Rivers, uh, by giving fluid 30 ml per kilo uh, in the first three hours. So they actually consider, when they looked at this, they considered this early goal-directed therapy is uh, a, like iatrogenic salt water drowning rather than resuscitation, because it's really a very, very big volume. So what is the problem with, with giving a lot of fluid, okay? Uh, first of all, it will affect all the organs in your body. Uh, starting from the brain, it can cause uh, cerebral edema, it can increase the ICP. Uh, moving on to the lungs, it can cause uh, pleural effusion, uh, it will decrease your compliance, it will uh, uh, make your ventilation difficult, uh, prolonged uh, ventilation and difficult weaning, increased work of breathing. It will also cause liver congestion, so that can affect the liver. And we, we all know that septic patients already, they, some, of, some of them can have uh, shock liver. So you're just deteriorating uh, the case more and more. And also in GI, that can cause uh, bowel edema. So you will have uh, ileus, malabsorption, uh, translocation, uh, abdominal wall edema. It will increase the incidence of wound infection and so on. And the, the, the kidneys also are are affected, it can cause acute kidney injury, okay? So there are a lot of studies looking at 
uh, the relationship between fluid and mortality. And they did find that uh, keeping the patient positive cumulative balance positive for like more than two or three days during his hospital stay or ICU stay will actually increase the mortality because of all of these complications that we mentioned. And this is a very interesting study which looked at the relationship between uh, uh, a high CVP or giving uh, a lot of fluid to patients and uh, the acute kidney injury. And actually um, what, what, we, what we always tell people to do is don't look at the CVP, look at the difference between the CVP and the MAP, because this difference, this is the pressure gradient. This is what's going to maintain the perfusion to the organ, okay? So always the higher the CVP, the, that means that the patients will uh, deteriorate uh, more and more. So we don't want the patient to end up like this, okay? And that's why the new, and even in, in trauma patients, uh, especially penetrating trauma, um, th they actually recommend that you should allow uh, hypertension, so permissive hypertension, uh, because they found that it, it increases the mortality Okay, uh, because if you increase the blood pressure in these patients, that will dislodge the clot and increase the bleeding. That can also hemodilute the clotting factors. So they said we will allow a systolic of nine in these kind of patients. So our main goal uh, in uh, when we are resuscitating or giving fluid to the patient is to try to choose the best fluid strategy by avoiding overload and to pick up the patients who are actually fluid unresponsive to avoid giving them more fluid. So how do we know that? Now there is a, a very uh, common uh, basic physiological concept, which I think you all know, which is the Frank Starling curve. And the Frank Starling curve, it looks at the relationship between the preload and the stroke volume. So uh, initially uh, when you uh, increase the preload or increase the CVP, you are going to automatically increase the stroke volume, okay? But that is within certain limits. After that, the heart cannot tolerate that anymore. And then no matter how much you give uh, volume, the patient or, or the heart will not respond to that. The stroke volume will still remain the same, and then you will go into overload, okay? So we want this, so we have the steep part of the curve. This is the preload responsiveness phase, okay? This is where you can give fluid. And then in the flat part of the curve, that's the unresponsive misfade. And this is where you want to uh, detect the patients uh, that uh, these patients, halas, you cannot give them any more fluid, okay? And that's very difficult to do. This is what all of this is going, is talking about, okay? And the other thing you have to keep in mind, patients who are uh, in heart failure, that actually this curve is actually flattened. So their threshold or the difference between the preload, the responsiveness, and the unresponsiveness is very, very small, okay? So they can respond uh, after a certain amount of volume. When you increase beyond that, they will go into uh, heart uh, pulmonary edema. So now we're going to talk about the different tests which we use to measure the fluid responsiveness. And in order to uh, assess the accuracy of these tests, we will use a common term which is called the rock curve or the area under the curve, okay? So uh, the area under the curve, it, it, it tells you whether this test actually is uh, true positive, so it's, it is accurate, or it, give, it will give you a false positive uh, result, okay? So when the area under the curve, as you can see here in the excellent, so it's, it reaches one. So anything above uh, 0.6 or uh, 0.8, that is considered accurate, an accurate test. Uh, something which is between uh, like 0 0.5 to 0 0.8. 0 0.5 means like it's 50-50. So the test can be accurate in, in half of the cases and can be not accurate in the other half. So it's like flipping a coin, okay? And then when it's less than 0.4, it's, it means that the test is useless. Um, so uh, when we looked at the CVP, now, unfortunately, still a lot of people, uh, they, uh, they like using CVP as a surrogate for uh, fluid resuscitation. Uh, CVP is one of the static variables. Now we do have two types of tests. We have a static test or a dynamic test. So in a static test, you are looking at one single reading, okay? And uh, it just gives you one read. So you, you don't know actually how the response is going to be. It's just one single reading at that time only, okay? Uh, so there was a lot of studies. This is a meta-analysis published in 2013. 
and they showed you that the area under the curve is 0.5. So it's like flipping a coin. So really we shouldn't be using the CVP anymore, uh, especially if it's a single test. If you use it as a trend, it might help. But as I, as I said earlier, uh, the only way, uh, uh, situation where I will use the CVP is when I will uh, compare it to the map and look at the difference between the CVP and the map. The higher the difference, that means the perfusion will be much more better, okay? So unfortunately, still around 50% uh, of intensivists, they believe in CVP and they use it to guide resuscitation, okay? And that's because that still uh, it's mentioned in the surviving sepsis campaign guideline. So 86% of the people use it because it's mentioned in the guidelines and they're really uh, strict to it. So that's why in the updated uh, surviving sepsis campaign guideline 2016, they did mention that uh, we recommend using dynamic variable over static variable to predict fluid responsiveness. Now, there are different uh, monitors which came out uh, to uh, looking at the fluid responsiveness. And uh, these are all uh, a replacement for the Swan-Gans catheter. Now, we used to use the Swan-Gans catheter uh, to measure the cardiac output, to measure the extravascular lung water, the stroke volume, and all of these things will give you an idea about the fluid responsiveness. But later on, we have found that it's too invasive. It has a lot of complications, and it's not indicated for all patients, actually. So they came out with a, a replacement, something which is less invasive, which is called the PICO, uh, Peripheral in, in, uh, Invasive Cardiac Output Monitoring, and the, to uh, analyze the pulse. So it's like, it's called the pulse contour analysis, okay? Also, uh, other uh, monitors use the pl platysma graphic waveform. So just from the pulse oximeter, you can get a lot of information about the stroke volume. And when they looked at the uh, accuracy of the, uh, so we have the pulse pressure variation and the systolic pressure, uh, stroke volume variation. Uh, so the pulse pressure variation uh, looks at the difference in the pulse pressure and the stroke volume variation will actually calculate how much the stro your stroke volume of your patient is. Uh, this, when they uh, looked at the accuracy of this uh, test, it's considered uh, highly accurate. So we have an AUC here of a point, point 0.94. So it is accurate. Um, the only problem is uh, that if you have a patient who is not intubated, uh, who's not paralyzed, uh, who's not taking a tidal volume of at least ML, uh, 8 ml per kilo, okay, uh, then it will not give you an accurate reading. So you have to have these criteria. So <clears throat> um, as we all know, in septic shock patients, especially if they develop ARDS, we cannot use a high tidal volume in this case. We always use uh, 6 ml or 4 ml per kilo per ideal body weight. So they try to look for another way to uh, use uh, or to guide us for fluid responsiveness. So what they did is they, they did something called tidal volume challenge. So uh, they check the pulse pressure variation at 6 ml per kilo, and then they measured it again at 8 ml per kilo. And then they calculated the difference between the pulse variation in 6 ml and in 8 ml. Usually the cutoff of 3.5 tells you or, or higher, tells you that this patient is fluid responsiveness, fluid responsive. Now, the other thing that you can do is giving uh, or doing something called fluid challenge. Uh, a fluid challenge, uh, before they used to say that, okay, we give, we give fluid challenge, for example, 500 ml or one liter, and we look at the clinical response. Now, we said the clinical signs are not really accurate. So we have to uh, make sure that the patient has a continuous cardiac output monitor, either a PICO, uh, you can use um, a carotid Doppler, uh, you can use uh, esophageal Doppler. So whatever uh, monitor or test that you have to continuously check the cardiac output monitor. Because what we need to do is we need to give the fluid certain amount over a certain time and then check the change in the cardiac output. If the change is more than 10% from the baseline, that means the patient is fluid response. And then they said, okay, so how much should we use? How much fluid bolus should we give? So this is a study which compared one ML per kilo to two ML, three ML or four ML. 
And they found that 1 ml is, uh, is useless. It will not detect anything at all. Three, uh, 2 to 3 ml is like borderline, and 4 ml is considered actually adequate. So usually they give 4 ml per kilo. So let's say in the 70 uh, kilo patient, you also, you will give around 200, 250 maximum. And you give it over uh, one minute because uh, usually the effect will be uh, for one minute. After that, you will not see uh, an effect of the, the bolus and check the cardiac output. Um, the other test, which is uh, really, really helpful, and it is, it is accurate, and it's very easy to be done, actually. In some ICUs, uh, the nurses, they do this test, okay? So it's called the passive leg raise test. Uh, so what you need is you need, uh, as we said, we have to have a monitor uh, for continuous uh, cardiac output or to measure the stroke volume, okay? And then, uh, you, as you see, the patient is first, he has to be in semi-recumbent position, 45 degrees, head up. Then you put the patient in horizontal position and lay, uh, raise the leg to 45 degrees for two minutes, okay? And then you look at the change in the cardiac output or the stroke volume. If the change is more than 10%, that is considered positive, and that means the patient uh, is fluid responsive and he might need more fluid. Now, the good thing about this, it's first of all, it has a very high AUC. The AUC is 0.95. Uh, it's rapidly reversible because what you're doing is you're doing an internal fluid challenge test. So you're not giving anything, any extra fluid to the patient. You're just mobilizing the fluid within his body from the lower limb to the heart, okay? And it's also uh, useful in situations where you cannot use the pulse pressure variation. As we said, patients who are spontaneously breathing, they're not intubated, patients who have low lung compliance or all the other contraindications for pulse pressure variation, you can use this, okay? So uh, the other test that they also use is called the end expiratory occlusion test. So if the patient is intubated, he has to be intubated here. Uh, you just perform uh, occlusion uh, or you like you, you hold the breathe for uh, 15 seconds, okay? And usually what will happen is that you're increasing the intrathoracic pressure. So that will increase the venous return and preload. So it's also like as if you're giving the patient fluid, okay? And also you will look again at the cardiac output and look at any increase above 10%. And some uh, people also, they combine the end, uh, end ex expiratory occlusion and end inspiratory occlusion. They found that one of these studies that it's, uh, it's I mentioned it here, um, they combined them both and they actually found that it's more accurate with a high AUC of 0.94. So uh, after all of these tests, wh what do we recommend? What should we use? Okay, uh, we need to be uh, we need to have a very good clinical sense, and uh, we have to keep in mind that not one single test will fit all the patients. So it depends upon uh, your clinical settings. It depends upon the patient. Uh, it depends upon what you are familiar with. Okay, so uh, you will. Uh, Sometimes we can combine these tests together. Sometimes we can do a test. We can use the CVP, for example, or the passive leg raise and uh, check the response and then use another test and see. So it's like a trial and error. Don't just um, fixate your mind to one single thing, uh, test or monitor and say, okay, that's it. I'm going to use it for all the patients. That's not going to help. So uh, also this uh, interesting uh, uh, a patient came out, which is uh, the classic trial, and uh, they ca came out with these recommendations. So they recommend that you give uh, isotonic crystalloid fluid bolus of 250 to 500 ml only if the lactate is more than four or the MAP is less than 50, despite norepinephrine infusion, if the modeling score is more than two or there's oligoria of less than 0.1 ml per kilo per ideal body weight in the last hour. Uh, some people, they are using uh, these criteria and some people are not. But if you notice that the trend now is to give a very small amount of fluid, it's, it's called the mini fluid challenge. So you don't need a large amount to see the response. Uh, usually they are, as we said, septic patients, they have diastolic dysfunction. They are very, very sensitive to fluid. So if they will not respond to 500 or 250 ml, uh, most likely they will not respond to uh, further um, uh, volume or bolus. Uh, so these are the pioneers that uh, have been looking to uh, fluid responsiveness and uh, fluid challenge. So we have uh, Professor John-Louis Taboul, uh, which I got most of the, the presentation from. 
Professor uh, Paul Marek. He's also one of the, the pioneers. And I really recommend that you just, uh, you can mention and just write down his name in YouTube or Google and you'll find a lot, a lot of literatures which are very interesting. And the last one is Professor Maurizio Ciccuni, which uh, also he is, uh, mashallah, he's one of the best in the in uh, fluid uh, fluid management. And this is also a, a useful um, site, which is ICU Reach. You can find a lot of uh, information yeah, in general for uh, ICU. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khadija, for your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Khadija, for your presentation. Uh, it's very uh, interesting and it's very uh, informative for all of us. Uh, now I'll introduce my colleague, Dr. Islam uh, Shahaka, Assistant Lecturer, uh, Department of Ancients, uh, University Department of Anesthesia, uh, Cairo, Egypt. Welcome, Doctor. You, he will discuss with us about hypotension reductive index in LCU. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, is, the, is my voice is clear? Is my voice yes. clear? Yes, Doctor. Let down one minute, and I'm gonna share my presentation. Uh, thanks, Dr. Khadija, for this uh, uh, interesting lecture. And I think uh, Jean Lewis Tipol is one of the uh, most uh, famous uh, ICU uh, physicians or science. Well, uh, I think I uh, met him in 2016 in Dubai, and he's uh, very, very smart. Um, so thanks again uh, to mention him, and uh, thanks for this uh, fruitful lecture. Uh, Dr. Khadija talked about the hemodynamics in the ICU, and uh, for five minutes, I'm going to talk about the future directions of uh, how to prevent the hypotension. You know, uh, the story, every very story in the ICU, the patient uh, blood pressure uh, got uh, low, uh, and the, you as a clinical or a physician or ICU uh, physician, you will react to that. Here, we are going to proact. The HPI or the hypotension predictive index is an index to predict the hypotension before its actual uh, event or its actual incident. Uh, the, there is a physiological compensation of hypotension uh, happening in every human being body, uh, either short term or large uh, or long term. Both are manipulating the blood pressure uh, through affecting the pump uh, uh, function of the heart or the blood vessel. Then they found that the, in the, the, this is for sure uh, a line or the arterial line. They found these waves of uh, invasive monitoring of blood pressure may reflect some of these changes. So if you detect the changes of the hypotension, that uh, does mean there is ongoing hypotension. So you can predict it before its actual instance. How? They look at the arterial wave and they can split it into, uh, split every uh, arterial wave or every cardiac cycle into five distinct phases. Some like this uh, represent the vascular tone. So if it's uh, increased, or decreased, it's about the systemic vascular resistance. Is this about the contractility of the heart? So if it's more or less, it's about the pump functions. Uh, another about the aortic compliance, the same with systemic vascular resistance and the afterload. After splitting every cardiac cycle into these phases, they can uh, detect any mini or subtle dynamic changes in everyone, and they, they gonna tell you what is, what is ongoing. Is it the problem in the heart itself, in the pump, or is the problem in the blood vessel? Then they, the, the, the same company, it's Woodward, one of the uh, huge companies in the monitoring of the ICU. 
uh, make a huge retrospective study of all the monitors around the world to detect what happened in the arterial waveform before the hypo tension. So it's about a software. It's a machine learning algorithm. It's about the uh, medical engineering. They uh, trace uh, the waveforms in many monitors, in many patients, in many surgeries, or even in the ICU, and detect any change in the form, in the pattern of the arterial waveform, and can, from this uh, software or from this algorithm uh, or machine learning algorithm, they can found a number. If this number is higher, your patient is supposed to get a high potential in one minute or five minutes or 15 minutes. And they called it high potential predictive index, an index to predict the high potential. So what the definition? It's a unit list number. There is no unit here. This unit list number depends on the analysis of features in the arterial pressure waveform. It's a it range from zero to 100. So higher values correlate with higher incidence of hypotension. If you have HPI of 90, your patient did uh, or expected to have uh, a hypotension soon. And they found after this study and after the analysis that, that the likelihood increased with the time. He, uh, HPI can tell you 15 minutes before the hypotension, there is a hypotension. If HPI increased, uh, he will, uh, it will give you another alarm, alarm, five minutes and hypotension will happen. And finally, one minute and the hypotension will happen. And for sure, if you uh, five minutes is more accurate than 15 minutes and one minute should be more accurate than five minutes. This is the device. It's uh, like uh, a dome of the arterial, uh, invasive arterial uh, line. And this is the Edward screen. So HBI will tell you, is there, is there any incidence of hypotension in one minute, five minutes, 15 minutes? That all, what, what should you do? You will get fluid, you will push some, uh, some AB or uh, what uh, you should do. HBI uh, provides you with what's called the second screen. So now it, it gives an alarm and there is a hypotension in the next or in the coming 15 minutes. It's not, it's not uh, just like that. It gives you what's called a second screen. This second screen from the A line, it can calculate the cardiac output. It can calculate the systemic vascular resistance. It can calculate uh, delta B and delta D uh, is refers to contractility. E dynamic refers to the arterial resistance, and the stroke volume refers to the stroke volume variability. So, if stroke volume is low, your patient needs some fluid. If the elastance or of uh, which reflects the systemic vascular resistance is low, systemic vascular resistance uh, low means dilated, so you can uh, push some vasoconstrictive. If it's all about the delta B and delta D, which refers to the contract contractility, you can support the pump function of the heart. So it gives you uh, it gives you an alarm. There is uh, coming hypotension, and it gives you what's called the potential root cause of hypotension. It, it doesn't lead it doesn't let you away or doesn't let you alone in front of the alarm it gives you a data a data about the vascular uh, about the stroke volume about the vascular resistance even about the cardiac output, output itself so and this is this is the most important item about it that it makes the physician coming from the reactive to the proactive rule Everyone in front of the hypotension, hypotension happens, the damage happens. Now you will react. Here, no, you will proact. You can expect the hypotension and it gives you some clue about the cause of hypotension so you can manage it before its incidence. Why? Because they found that even one minute of hypotension, by definition, mapped or mean arterial pressure less than 60, is correlated with a stroke, MI, and AKI or acute kidney injury. So even one or five minutes or 10 minutes of hypotension uh, can affect the ultimate outcome of your patient. This is the real, uh, so a real uh, screen of the device. Now HBI is 86 over 100. It's a high. Your patient, uh, the instance of the likelihood of the probability of hypotension is high. Then look at this screen. 
here the cardiac about a 3.5. It's like, you know, borderline. The stroke vascular resistance from uh, 700 up to 100, uh, 1,005. So it's high. There is nothing about here. Look at the delta B on delta D. It, it, it should be more than 1,000. It's about 831. So the contractility that only has a lower value. Now your pressure is 100 over 60. Uh, the alarm, your patient will get hypotension soon. Now the contractility is the clue, not the vascular resistance. Rock volume may be 70. So, you know, it, it pushes you against or it pushes you against, uh, the, it pushes you toward the solution. It's about the pump. And you know, even in the heart failure, the systemic vascular resistance will increase. So I think this patient may be a classic scenario of heart failure. The limitation that you need ALI, it's an invasive technique. ALI can uh, affect the arterial supply of the hand, so you, or even if the leg, if you put femoral line, so it's invasive. This is a disadvantage. The um, I, I I should go right now because of you know the, we have a cardiac arrest. I think this is the only uh, it's invasive. Uh, it can't tolerate the acute changes and the arrhythmia. If you have atrial fibrillation, you will not detect this. Uh, you will not detect this changes in the ALI. The last two slides is about uh, the Google uh, or Google Square articles of the HBR. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor Islam, uh, for Thank your you. uh, effort. Uh, and no, you are you. in the in your work now. Uh, and sorry for interruption. If you can go for the case, no problem. Uh, I think there is no question till now. And if there is any question, we can yeah. ask Khadija if available. Yeah, thank you. It's very uh, good topic and interesting uh, index. Uh, but thank I want you. to ask: It is available in all ICU? Uh, yeah, yeah, in US, yes. In Ohio State, they started it last year. Egypt. Yeah, no, no, for sure, no. Huh? Okay. Yeah, but... You asked the doctor Khadija, which is available have, in Bahrain. We have used it yes, in the... available in Bahrain. Yes, you they brought it as a demo, and we have we have used it on uh, on real patients. Yes. Great. Can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Yeah, it's regarding this device, hypertension prediction index. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Khadija can answer me. How, how do you diagnose cardiogenic shock on this? See, uh, it gives a, an idea about uh, stroke volume variability, dynamic elastins, SVR. So you're getting an idea about preload, afterload, and DP by DT of contractility. But how do you diagnose cardiogenic shock on this device? Like, where uh, uh, do we have an idea about the wedge on this device? Shock, but it just it just gives you an idea of uh, yani what what you should do what you should focus on should you treat uh, should you focus on increasing the SVR or should you focus on increasing the contractility so it, it just okay. gives you an idea or like a hint I, I don't I'm not a big fan of it I don't think it's really really accurate it can give you just like a, um, uh, like a guide and 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 then you correlate with it like on clinical uh, basis, but uh, you cannot, I don't think you can rely on it alone. Yeah, because as an intensivist, you would agree that you would be more worried about shock hypertension rather than plain hypertension. So uh, does it give an idea that the patient is going into shock rather than patient is going into hypertension? Well, uh, actually most of these patients, they're already on enotropes, so they are in shock. They are, they in, are shock. in shock. But it guides you, it tells you whether you need to increase the dose of the enotropes or the vasopressors or whether you need to add an enotrope if there is an element of, uh, of cardiomyopathy or like uh, reduced. But I think uh, Dr. Islam uh, gave a slide uh, showing that it is uh, approved. Yani, uh, it, is, uh, it, it give you idea if the patient will go in, uh, in hypotension or not. Maybe the patient oh, yes, yes. has hypotension, yes. It's, it's very it interesting. It is predictive, not uh, for the treatment of the situation. Yeah, it's very interesting. So we can write uh, the question, Dr. Benayek and Dr. Islam, we can later also yeah. answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Dr. Muhammad uh, will uh, present the next speaker. Yeah. The, uh, thank you, Dr. Shema. Thank you, Dr. Shema. 
And our uh, next uh, topic will be about the infection control in ICU. And uh, Ms. Maha Maharaj, uh, she's a senior ICU uh, staff nurse. Uh, she will talk about the, how they are practicing the infection control in uh, ICU. And we, I think we will learn a lot on this session, uh, very important topic about the control of infection in uh, ICU. Ms. Maha, you are ready, you can start. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mohammed, for your uh, great introduction. Um, I'm going to share my slides. Can everybody hear me clearly? Yes, go ahead. All right. Um, as he said, Dr. Mohammed, uh, my name is Maha Al Maharaj. I'm a liaison infection control and adult ICU and SMC. 19 years, uh, 19 years, I'm a senior staff nurse. Inshallah, you will get a gain from my lecture and uh, you will get benefit from that. So we'll start our lecture as regarding the infection control and intensive care unit, all right? We are going to talk regarding the basic of the chain of the infection, how to break the chain, what is the different type of the hand hygiene on the hospital, what is the difference between the standard precaution and the transmission, how to wear the PPE and to remove it, how to practice in proper way of waste segregation and uh, how to cover your cuff during your sneezing and how what is the cleaning or disinfectant sterilization of the items of the patient care and the lab environmental cleaning in the end the uh, how to give the safe injection so before we'll start our presentation we should know some of the terminology of the infection. So later on, when we say it during my presentation, you can understand what is mean of that, all right? So let us start with the pathogen. What is the pathogen? The pathogen, it is a bacteria or the virus or prunes or whatever is it. It is, in the end, it is a microorganism which can cause the disease or harm for the patient. What about the infection? The infection, it is the microorganism when it is entering to the our body and causing the harm. So what is the infection disease? The infection disease, it is the disorder which is happening to the patient either directly or indirect. And we'll see later on through my presentation how it will be direct or indirect transmission. What about the zoonotic disease? The zoonotic disease, it's the infection which you are getting from the animals. Either you will get it from animals or you will give to the animals so there is some animals it is inside this topic all right so zoonotic disease it's between the person and the animals what about the infection control the infection control as you can see from the title control that's mean what is your action what is your practice you should do to prevent this problem so why it is important that it should be infection control in the icu because the ICU, it's a very critical and it's a vital unit in the hospital, which there will be a very sick patient. They are coming with a multiple of the disease. So they were immunity, they will be low. Second thing, there will be a lot of devices. They will use it for the patient, which will cause sometimes uh, if it was malpracticing, it will cause the infection for the patient. So there is something called hospital acquired infection. What does mean of that? That means the patient, he will get the infection in the hospital, not from the community. It will, they will get the infection from the hospital, all right? When we will say this patient, he get the infection during the hospitalization. If he developed the infection sign and symptoms more than 48 hours after admission to the hospital, or after discharge from the hospital within two days. So that mainly it should be more than 48 hours. You will tell me why it is 48 hours, because some of the microorganisms, they will colonize in our body after 48 hours. So that's why we will mention it as a hospital acquired infection. Also, it is known case of nosocomial infection or hospital association infection. It is all the same definition. The nozo, it is mean disease. The nozo coming in, that's mean related to the hospital. That's mean that 
disease, which is the patient will get it, it is from the hospital, not from the community. Is it important to prevent that? Yes, because if the patient was to stay on the, if the patient, uh, you want to discharge him, after that, he will get the infection from the hospital. What will happen? The patient, he will stay prolonged on the hospital. So if he stay on the hospital, what he will do for him? Again, you have to pay for her, you have to administer for her medication. You have, maybe he needs some lines like intubation, like central line, like CBD and so on, or CT, MRI. These all, that mean you will spend more money. If you spend more money, that means the cost, it will be very high. Is it correct? Then also it may, after all this treatment, there is no, uh, there's no benefit from that, the patient, because he will be deteriorated. Maybe he will go to the shock, so septic shock. So that's why he will be at high risk for mortality. So the main important to prevent that is to prevent the prolonged hospitalization, to reduce the cost, and in the end, to reduce the mortality rate. There is also, they call, uh, call it as unknown killer. Why unknown killer? Because you will never get any death certificate. They will tell you the patient died because of the hospital acquired infection. But uh, during that, there is multi, uh, there is consequence of that, which will lead to the patient to the die in the end. There is different type of the hospital acquired infection, which they are mainly, Clapsy. What does it mean of clapsy? It is central line associated bloodstream infection. All right. What about the county? It is catheter association urinary tract infection. VAP. It is ventilator association pneumonia. And the last surgical site infection, which is abbreviated by SSI. What does it mean of that? That's me. The patient, he will get a blood infection because of the central line. You just do it in this way all right if the patient having the cbd so the patient will get urine infection because of cbd the patient will get pneumonia or the lung infection because of ventilator the patient will get the surgical wound infection because of surgery all right so it is it's working like that okay how it's happening this way exactly how it will be happening through the chain of infection. What is the chain of infection? It is the name, chain. Chain, that means they are related to each other, all right? There is the infection, there is a six, mainly six chain of infection, which they are the first one, infections agent. What is mean of infection agents? The pathogen. You remember the pathogen? We see it about it. It is the microorganism. Either it is a bacteria, fungi, parasite, or prawns, all right? Then, what is the second link or the second chain? It is the reservoir. What is mean of reservoir? The reservoir is the place where the microorganism, they will live and multiply, all right? Where they will live, they may live in the people, how it's living on the people, and their skin, all right? And the water, so that's why they will tell you, you have to dry the site, so it will not be any growth of contamination. Then the food, so that's why they will get a food poisoning, right? Then the third links or the thing, the third chain, it is the portal of exit. What is mean of portal of exit? From the name, portal of exit. That's mean the way how this microorganism coming out from the person to the uh, area, all right? Then, by which mood they will transmit this out? It is the mood of transmission, either physically, directly contact, or droplet, or by the elbow, which is sneezing or coughing, all right? Then the portal of entry. What does it mean of portal entry? That means the way how this microorganism coming inside our body. Like what? Like when you are keeping the CBD under not accepted technique. So you are inserting the germs inside. If you make any proper way of intubation, again, you are entering the germs inside the lungs. If you are keeping central line without any accepted technique, again, you are entering the, the germs, all right? Then you have susceptible host. What does it mean of that? That means who are at high risk to get the infection, which they are the people with the low immunity, the chronic disease, like who's having the diabetic, who's having the hypertension, 
hypertension, who's having the burn, who's having the multiple surgery, and the age, mainly the age whom they are the elderly and the children. Why? Because they have immunity low, all right? So if you keep all these links, which they are the six, the microorganism, the place, the portal of entry, the portal of exit, the way how it's come is doing that, and the suspecto holes, this is all, if you keep it together, the patient will have infection. I'll give you a very small example. For example, you will give the medication, all right? We are giving the medication for the patient. So here, the mainly, it will be the bacteria. The bacteria in the matrix set. In the port, if you not clean it, what you have, what you will do, you will penetrate the portal of entry. You will just inject the medication inside the matrix set. You will make this germs to go through the vein of the patient and might cause infection for the patient. All right. So you just take this link or this chain in multiple scenario in your practice. All right. Then. So we are, as a healthcare workers, what we should do? We have to break. We have to break this chain. How we can break this chain? We can break this chain through multiple infection measures. Like what? The one, the first, the easy, and the simple, and the cheap one is the hand hygiene, all right? The hand hygiene, there is, as I said, there is in our skin, normally there is a normal flora, normal flora in our skin, but it is usually, it will living in our skin and not causing any harm. But once it will penetrate to your body and there will be any, uh, it will be fighting with your immune system. If you have a good immunity, you can overcome it of it. But if you have a low immunity, what will happen? you will get the infection, which will be transit, okay? There is a resident, there is transit. The resident, which is the normal one, the transit, which will be the complicated after enter to our body. There is mainly two things, hospital hand hygiene, which they are hand wrap or hand wash. You can know the hand wrap, it will be with the gel. The hand wash, it will be with the water and the soap. Okay, what is the difference between them? The timing, all right? The timing in the hand wrap, it will be 20 to 30 seconds. And the double, it's the hand wash. You just memorize it like that. The hand wrap, it is the uh, half of the hand wash. The hand wrap, you will use 20 to 30 seconds, but the hand wash, which is the double, it will be 40 to 60 seconds. But the main procedure itself, it is the same. If you can see the picture that the hand wrap, you will use the alcohol hand wrap, which is the gel. But the hand wash, it is the water and the soap, all right? But the procedure from number two to number seven, they are exactly the same procedure, no change, all right? And how long this will, it will take from you? 50 to 20 seconds, okay? This procedure which you are doing, it will be, for it, uh, 15 to 20 seconds. But the whole procedure, if you make a hand wash by keeping the water and soap, then you will wash your hand and water and soap, then you will dry it, it will take 40 to 60 seconds, all right? Some of the area, if you did not do it, all the procedure the two to seven, you will have a missed area, okay? You will tell me how. Let me to show you, this is a very short video. It will show you that if you didn't do it all the procedure, you will have their missing area. If you can see, he's making a black uh, color. See, when he's doing that other procedure, the same procedure, you will see it is covering all your hand. There will not be any mist. It was very clear.
say that's why it is very important you have to do the full procedure two to seven all of them that means you will cover all your hands there will not be any missed area all right then this picture is showing you how much the effective of the water and the soap and the timing of your hand washing okay if you can see the first picture it is full with the white that's me the powder this means the germs all right so here they are before washing then what they have done the second picture they use only the water only they use the water any difference yes there is a very slight difference what about the third picture they increase the time but they use only the water see it is six seconds without soap there is again more effective then they use the same time the six seconds but here with the soap see any difference yes it is much different then they increase the time and they use again the soap and the water what happened again different what about the last one the 30 second with the soap there is a much different so the effectiveness of the time and using the soap it is more effective than if you did not use it there is something called five movements hand hygiene the five movements hand hygiene they are that mean what is the situation you should use your hand wash or hand rub because the hand hygiene the hand hygiene it will be divided into two either hand rub or hand wash all right so the hand five movements hand hygiene that's mean which situation or which moment you should clean your hand number one you just memorize it like that there will be a three before and two after three uh, three before sorry two before two before and three after okay what is mean of that that mean before touching the patient before cleaning or accepting technique okay what does mean before touching the patient that's me before directly touching the patient for example some of the doctors around they will come to visit the patient all right so what they will do directly they will touch the patient like reassuring without any cleaning their hand no here you have to stop and you have to clean your hand what about the nurse she wants just to uh, to uh, for example she just again she wants to touch the patient without cleaning her hand she was writing in her note then the patient called her to give her to give him something so in that case again you should stop and you have to clean your hand what about the before aseptic technique before aseptic technique that's mean like what before inserting the uh, lungs for example you want to give medication you want to start iv for the patient iv cannula for the patient okay before you are giving uh, uh, you are doing the procedure so you have to clean your hand what about the third one the third one is after body exposure what is mean of after body exposure the body exposure that's mean uh, it doesn't mean only the blood it can be body fluid like for example urine okay you will empty the urine all right you will collect the blood so in that situation you have to clean your hand after touching the patient it will be like, for example, after you give the medication for the patient, after you change the position of the patient, after you did the suctioning, you have to clean your hand. In the end, after touching the patient's arm, and all of them, they are missing in this area. What does it mean after uh, touching the surround of the patient, all right? That means anything, anything on the patient room, you have to clean your hand. For example, there will be alarm on the ventilator. Once you will close the alarm, you have to clean your hand. If you are closing the door of the patient, you have to clean your hand. If you touch the patient trolley, you have to clean your hand. If you touch the patient fire, you have to clean your hand and so on. So anything on the patient's around, you have to clean your hand. Even touching the patient's side rails, again, you have to clean your hand. So you just memorize it like that. There is two before and three after, which is before touching the patient, before accepting the clean, after touching the patient, after being exposed to body fluid, and after uh, touching the surround of the patient. And there is some of the example of surround the patient, 
you can see which is the pointed with the green color. Even switching the light, you are used is that touching the curtain. This is all. Anything inside, you have to clean your hand. All right. There are some study they have done. Jack Pitt on. 2018, they have compared between the germs on the disc of the nursing station compared with the toilet, all right? So they have seen there is almost 400 times more germs on the toilet seat, okay? There was a number of the bacteria per square in inch. They have found in the telephone around 25,000. What about the keyboard? It is 3,000. What about the disk itself? 20,000, all right? So it usually in the most 1,600, okay? So usually the germs, you cannot see it, but when you are keeping the UV, as you can see in this picture, they are making a compare between the picture with the UV and without UV, which is ultraviolet light, okay? So if you can see in the switch light, the normal situation, you cannot see any germs. You cannot see any uh, white color, right? So the white color, this is the germs, okay? That means there is a dirty places, all right? So you can see in the switch, see the difference, how much is between them? What about the desktop? The desktop also, see how much the difference between the keyboard without UV and the keyboard with the UV? So that's why the problem with the germs, you cannot see it. All right, so that's why sometimes you will not be taking any precaution. Usually, if you are seeing some dirty place or some dirty with the blood, for example, you uh, you are touching the the surface, you saw there are some drops of the blood. What you will do? You will take gloves, you will clean it, and so on. But if you see the trolley without any dots, without anything, what you will do directly? You will touch it. All right. So the problem always you just imagine that the germs is everywhere. So that's why you have to clean your hand before and after. All right. There are some factors. It will affect your cleaning of your hand. You will tell me, I wash my hand. I will tell you, yes, you wash it. You tell me, okay, 20 seconds I use. Okay, thank you very much. But you have to also to think there is something also it will it will be like a barrier between cleaning your hand, which they are your watch, because the hand, the, if you keep the watch, that means you cannot wash your hand proper way, okay? If you are using the rings, there is certain uh, ring you should wear, the hand rings, only the wedding with the plain shape of the ring, okay? If you are using the design one, the germs, it will be contaminated inside and you cannot clean it nicely with the water and the soap. Okay, what about the nail polishing? The nail polish, again, the nail polish, you cannot uh, uh, guarantee that your hand is fully clean, all right? And the long sleeves, okay? Is it clear? So now we get the first step to break the chain, it is the hand hygiene. What about the personal protective equipment? What does it mean of that PPE? The PPE, that means what the things I should wear to protect myself and to protect the others, all right? That means it is not only for you as a healthcare workers. The PPE, it is a two way for the patient and for yourself, okay? Maybe you are having the infection, you will transmit to the patient. Maybe the patient will transmit to you, not always the patient is transmit the infection for you. Okay, in the end, you are human, all right? So the, you have to wear these things according to the degree and the risk of exposure. What does it mean of that? The items, as you can see, there is gloves, there is a mask, there is a gown, there is a goggle or the face shield, all right? So what the things I should wear it, okay? Then for how much the things I should wear it, that's me. For example, you will do the changing position for the patient, okay? What you will wear? You will wear the gown and the gloves, okay? You will do section of the patient. You will do section of the patient. That means I have to wear the mask, I have to wear the face shield, and I have to wear the gown, is it? So that's why you have to select the PPE or the personal protective equipment according to your procedure and how much the risk of getting exposure for the body or blood fluid. Is it clear? 
Okay. Now you will tell me, okay, so which one I should uh, first to choose? I have to, you have to choose according to the precaution. Okay. You should know what is the precaution you should take to the patient. According to that, you have to use the personal equipment. All right. Let us to start. There is a two of the two uh, way of the uh, two uh, classification of precaution. There is standard precaution. There is a transmission phase precaution, which they are the, exactly the same. Alternative name: isolation precaution. All right. The standard precaution. This one keep in your mind. You have to apply it for all the patients on the hospital regardless the patient is infected or not infected all right we have faced a lot of uh, cases that the patient infection after a few days you will notice he has infection or there is a miscommunication the patient already is infected but nobody is know about him so that's why you have to take the standard precaution and to apply it for all the patient you have to think about the patient all of them they are infected all right in the standard precaution, again, you have to select the PPE according to the procedure what you will do. But in the isolation precaution or the transmission based precaution, no. In that case, you have to use exactly what is written in the card, all right? Because this patient, you are guaranteed that he is having this infection. So it is most of you to where the what is written in the code. Let us to start with the contact. What does it mean of contact? The contact of precaution, that means the uh, infection which will be transmitting to you by contact. Like which cases? Like MDR cases. Which they are MDR cases? They are multi-drug resistant, like MRSA, CRE, ESBL, BRE, and so on. All right? So, what the things you should wear it if you can see in the picture it should be gloves and it should be the gum this is the main issue the main thing in addition to that the standard precaution right for example now the most here they will tell you you have to wear the gloves and the gum is it correct all right but in addition to standard precaution for example you will do suctioning so in that case you will tell me I have to wear only the gloves and the gum. No, you have to wear also the mask and the face shield because you will do suctioning. Is it clear? All right. What about the second one, the droplet? The droplet precaution in that case, no. This one, it will be through the uh, services. The droplet, it will be with the sneezing or respiratory, okay? But the molecule of these germs, they are heavy. So what will happen to the germs? They will be dropped to the surfaces, okay? So it will not stay on the air, it will be on the surfaces. So in that case, you have to wear the uh, uh, surgical mask because the mask, we have two types. We have surgical mask, we have N95 mask. In this case, if you can see in the picture, it should be the surgical mask, all right? And we have to wear the face shield or the goggle. It is the same one. And the gum and the gloves. Is it clear? And the mask, where you should discard it? Outside of the patient room or inside the patient room? No, you have to discard it inside the patient room because it is not in the air. It is on the services. All right? What about the, like which cases? Like we have H1N1, like in fill one the A, we are wearing the, we are taking the droplet precaution. What about the airborne from, it is the name airborne. That means the germs, they are light and they will stay on the air. So when it will stay to the air and you are entering, what you will do, you will inhale this germs, like which cases, like TB patient. TB patient, you must to wear N95, not the surgical mask, N95 mask. Second thing, the door always will close and negative pressure. What does it mean of negative pressure? The negative pressure, that means the uh, room, it should be, the, all the ventilation should be inside the room and it should not go outside the room. So there will be a specialized room for the airborne patients, all right, with the negative pressure. 
because if you keep a positive pressure, that means the air, it will go everywhere and everybody will be as infection, all right? And where you should discard the mask? In airborne precaution, you should discard the mask outside the room. Why? As we say, the germs, it is on the air. Once you will remove the mask inside the room, might you will inhale the germs. What about the last one? And it is protective isolation. The protective isolation they are using for the low immunized patient, uh, immunocompromised patient, like leukemia, like a cancer patient. They are using this. This is the most important. Door should be closed. No children visit the patient, and no sick patient they should visit them. No teddy uh, bears or any toys, and it should not be any flowers. Why? Because their immunity is low and very quick to get the infection. Okay, then how to wear? Now I have understand what the things I should wear and in which cases I should wear. Now, how to wear, all right? How to wear, you just, I give you a very simple way to memorize it, which they are in the donning or wearing the PPE or the dove removing the PPE. When you are wearing the PPE, what you should keep? Number one, uh, always keep in your mind when you are wearing, you should keep it from down to up, to start from down to up. But when you are removing, you should start from up to down. Is it clear? All right, let us to give another thing that if you are doing the wearing, wearing the uh, PPE, first of all, you have to do hand wash, as we said, or not hand wash, it can be hand wrap even. In the end, it is hand hygiene. The second thing, the shoes cover, then the gown, the mask, the goggle, then the gloves. Is it clear? So we'll start with the hand hygiene, then the shoes cover, then two, uh, gown. The most important in the gown, two things. Number one, it should be uh, secure your neck properly, and it should cover all your gown in the back. It should not showing your gown or your uh, scrap, all right? Because maybe you will turn here and there and you will touch the side of the patient room, all right? The third one, the mask. The mask, it should be covering full your face, which is the nose, the mouth, and the cheek, or the chain, all right? And you should always, whenever you are wearing the mask, you should check the fit test, all right? You will know there is any inhale the air or it is uh, loose. So you have to check that, all right? Then the goggle and in the end, the glove. The most important on the glass, it should be covering above the gown, not under the gown or with the gown. It should be above the gown. Why? Because when you remove it, you will not touch your direct skin, all right? So again, hand hygiene, shoes cover, then the gown, the mask, the goggle, and the gloves. Now I want to remove what I should do I have to remove first from up to down. So you will remove the glove. How to remove the glove? Not do it directly inside. No, the first one, you should remove from outside. The second, you have to keep your hand inside and remove it, all right? So the way how you are removing the gloves is very, very important, all right? After that, you will do hand hygiene. Then what you will remove? You will remove the goggle and the gum, then the hand hygiene, the gown, the most important, you will not touch it from outside. You have to keep your hand inside and removing. And then you will remove the shoes cover, hand hygiene. In the end, you will keep the mask. Why? It is dependent on the situation. If it was airborne, you will throw it outside the room. If it is drop it or any other infection, you can keep it inside the room. All right? So we have get over with the PPE. Now hand hygiene and the PPE. Let us to start with the safe injection. The safe injection, what the things you should do it to protect your patient not getting infection through the injection giving, all right? The first of all, hand hygiene, which they are either hand wash or hand wrap. Accept the technique. You should take a blue tray. You have to clean it nicely to open your uh, things in proper way, all right? Then single use, you should not share the medication with the patient. You should not uh, use the single use for multiple time, all right? Then we have 
to also check. We have to check the buyer or the glass. There is any expire, there is any damage on the ampule or the glasses, there is any change in the color. You have to check, all right? Then you have to disinfect vial sprouter. What does mean of that? This means the glasses or the vial, okay? You both of them you have to clean it before using, okay? Do not clean only after use. For example, there is some medication. It can be multiple use. Is it correct? Okay. You will tell me it is a new, but I will clean the used one. No. Even the new one, once you will open the cover, okay, of the new one, you have to clean because you don't know the company, how they close it, how they pack it. So in, in, as a precaution, we have to clean once you will open it, either a new or reuse one. Okay, and there is international statement of the safe injection, which is this one. What is mean of one? One of the needle, one of the syringe, and one of the time. That's me. A new needle, a new syringe, and only one time you will use this syringe. You cannot use it multiple use. Okay, what about IV tube and the connection should be single according to the manufacturer. And if there is any multiple use medication, you have to keep the date and the time so you will know when you will discard it. Once it should be also prepare the medication on the uh, design area. It should not be inside the room, the patient. Once you will enter by mistake to the patient room, then you have to use for this patient and then directly you have to discard it. What about occupational health? Occupational health, they are the people who dealing with the physically and mentally of the staff. What is the mean of the healthcare workers? That means if there is a stress, sickness, or unsafe workplace, what will happen? There will be a lot of absence, a lot of injury, a lot of illness. So what they will do? Number one, you have to follow your vaccination. There is a special vaccination for each category, for the doctors, for the nurses, for the clerk, for the hospital attendants. All of them, they have a special vaccine. They should take it, all right? Number two, if you have any needle break, you have to inform them. If you have any exposed to the TB patient without knowing, for example, this patient was not on T, not TB. After a few days, doctor telling you he's acquiring TB. On that case, you within these days, you take care of him, right? So you have to inform the infection control and the occupational health, what, uh, what the exposure you have done with him. So they will tell you exactly what you should do. Also, you have to avoid eating or drinking the clinical area only on the design area, which is coffee room. And you have to limit your personal item like a phone, like a bag, because there was a study shows that most of the healthcare workers, they are having in their cell phone in, uh, a cyanobacter microorganism, okay? So you have to be careful, always your cell phone to be clean also, all right? Then you have to uh, use the PPE according to the situation or the procedure and you have to uh, follow the instruction, all right? Then, what about the patient care equipment? The patient care equipment, the, the, anything you are using for the patient, for example, the EGT, the EGT machine or uh, hemoglobin test machine, it should be single for the patient, but if you are sharing with the others, you have to clean it before and after, all right? Even if a stethoscope you are using for multiple patient, you have to clean it before and after. So the, the uh, patient care equipment, you have to use the proper way of cleaning. The ECG machine, ECG machine, you can use it for multiple patients. Again, you have to clean it before and after to be sure it is clean and you will not transmit any infection for other patients, all right? What about the health devices? and equipment. There is a th three classification for the health care uh, devices and equipment for the cleaning, all right? There is something called critical items, semi-critical items, and non-critical items. The critical items, which they are using, for example, in the surgery, all right? This instrument, they are directly touching the patient blood, the tissue, and the bone, and so on. So this is the patient, this item is need sterilization, all right? What about the semi-critical patient? Semi-critical patient, which they are 
using and touching the mucous membrane or the non-intact skin. For example, bronchoscopy, the uh, machine. This one, we have to use a high level of disinfection. What about the non-critical items like you have stethoscope, a GT machine, BB cup, and so on. So they are directly intact with the patient's skin. In that case, you have to use the low level of disinfection. What about the cover your cup? Cover your cup when you are coughing or sneezing. What you should do to not transmit the infection for the others? You have, first of all, you can use the tissue and discard it. Or you have to use your elbow, not to use your hand. Never, ever to use your hand because your hands you will touch everywhere. So you should use your elbow and cup on it, all right? Then, if you have a mask, then it is preferable also to wear the mask, okay? Then, after that, what you will do? You have to use hand hygiene, which they are. Hand wash or hand rub. Is it clear? Then environmental cleaning, always you have to be sure your environmental is clean. This is a domestic site also. They have to use a proper uh, equipment and the solution which is approved by your hospitalization. Linen, also you have to prevent any infection, the linen uh, transmission to the others by using the proper hamper to throw these linen things. For example, the white, it should be for the, uh, the dry and it should be not infected patient. The red is for the infected patient and, or the wet with the blood or the urine or vomiting or whatever. And the green, it should be for the OT patient, okay? So most of them, you should use a proper practice by discarding these linen items. What about the waste segregation? When you are discarding the items, okay, you have to use a proper practice by discarding the uh, items. You have the red bag. There is a different uh, waste segregation. There is a red, yellow, and black, and so on. So the red color usually we are using with the body part, usually with the boot part, all right? What about the yellow? It should be for the infected and very heavily soaked blood or body fluid. What does it mean of heavily soaked? That means it is a dropping, all right? The sharp container. The sharp container also, you have to discard any sharp items, which will be directly uh, after using these items, okay? And the black, it will be for general waste, okay? Or minimal soaked with the blood or body fluid. Then, what about the HAI? How we can prevent the patient not get infection from the lines, like you have collapse or the central line? How you can prevent the patient not to get blood infection from the central line? We, there is something called prevention bundles, prevention bundles, which they are containing four elements. First, we'll start with the start insertion. The insertion, that's me. What the things I should do when I'm inserting the patient for the patient central line without causing him any infection? Number one, the hand hygiene. Then we have to wear a proper PPE for who? For the for the doctor and the assistant. Not only the doctor; it should be the doctor and the assistant. Then the chlorhexidine. The chlorhexidine cleaning it should be preferable than the pitadine. All right, but if the patient having allergy, then we can use the pitadine. All right, and the fourth one it should be the optimal site selection. Most of the adult patient they should insert for them subclavian central line. It is preferable than other the IG or the femoral. The femoral it is the last choice for the central line insertion. Why? Because the place of the central line, it is on the groin area where there will be a sweating, hair, so it will be, or the urine, it will be mixed with the urine or the stool of the patient. So that's why it is not preferred to use the femoral side. So you, it is preferable subclavian, all right, on the adult. But if you will insert the basket, then you have to keep on the IG. It is preferable than the subclavian. Why? Because it will cause the thrombosis or the stenosis. All right. What about the maintenance? What we mean by maintenance? That's me. I have I get a patient with the central line. What I should do as a healthcare worker to prevent infection? Number one, again, hand hygiene. 
Number two, you have to use the uh, sterile technique by using the gloves, sterile gloves, when you want to manipulate or to administer medication or you want to make a dressing for him. And when you have to change the IV set, the IV set is very important also to change it according to the manufacturer. All right. What about the dressing? The dressing, that means which type of dressing you should use to cover the central line side. You should use Y2, either chlorhexidine or the transparent uh, dressing goods, which is there will be a chlorhexidine gel, or you can use the gauze in case if there is any oozing or sweating. All right. Review. What about the review? That means it should be daily review by the healthcare workers, by the nurses, by the doctors to check the site, to check the uh, any any infection, any discharge, uh, still patient need or no need. So this is very important to do it in daily basis. All right. And plus, as soon as possible, you are removing as soon as uh, uh, the chance of getting the clepsy reducing. What about the county with the CBD? On the, if the patient on CBD, what I should do to prevent infection? Number one, appropriate indication. What is the mainly use of keeping for this patient CBD? Is there is any strong reason like patient having acute retention? So in that case, yes, the patient needs CBD. It is not only like that you insert it for the patient. For example, if I need a blood, I mean urine culture. So does I need to insert the CBD? No. You should not insert the CBD only to get the urine culture, all right? So you have to decide the correct situation when you have to insert the CBD. Number two, aseptic technique. What does mean aseptic technique? The aseptic technique, that means during the insertion, what the things I should use to, or to do to prevent the CBD uh, infection during the insertion. Number one, again, hand hygiene. Then I have to use the proper antiseptic solution. Then the proper size, especially if it is smaller, it is preferable. Why? To prevent any urethral damage, okay? What about the lubricant? The lubricant always, always, it should be a new one, not the used one, all right? Then appropriate maintenance. What does mean appropriate maintenance? That means what's the things I should do when I'm getting a patient with the CBD? Number, it, you just memorize it on this situation, two, three parts, the bag, the site, and the site, okay? What about the bag? The bag, it should be in the closed system. Second thing, it should be below the bladder. Why you want it to below the bladder? To drain the, the urine out uh, the urine, and it should be on the, uh, not touching the floor. Also, it should not be above the bed, why? because there will be a urine backflow, which this one all, it will be contaminated with the germs and might will go to the urine and urinary bladder and it will cause the infection, okay? What about the thigh? The thigh, two things. First of all, it should not be obstructed the tube. The second one, it should not, it should be secure with the CBD holder. What about the site? The site, you have two things. First, if you want to replace the catheter CBD, it should be a septic technique. Then we have to do routinely hygiene. What does it mean routinely hygiene? That's me. When I'm opening the underbed of the patient, I'm not just checking there is a leaking or there is any, uh, um, any pus coming. No, you have to clean the site as a routine. With each changing position, we have to, change, uh, to clean the preannual site. Uh, to prevent any infection, all right? Then the daily review, it is the same one. That means if the patient on the CBD, then you have to, uh, to uh, still need it or no need, all right? What about the aseptic, uh, what about the VAP? What things you should do? First of all, you have to elevate the head. Why you are elevating head for 35 to 40 30 to 45 degree because to prevent any aspiration. Number two, daily sedation. Why daily sedation? Uh, interruption, because we want to make the patient more awake. So once the patient more awake, that means the patient will uh, early extubation. Number three, peptic ulcer prophylaxis. Why? Because to prevent any gastric aspiration. DVT prophylaxis, if 
not contraindicated because to prevent any DVT. Once you will prevent the DVT, because a patient develop patient on sedation, he will be continuously lying down, no activity. So what will happen? Then he might get the thrombosis um, developing. This thrombosis, it will move to the lung and it will cause pulmonary embolism, all right? So it is better to start for the patient, DVT prophylaxis, if not contraindication. What about the oral care? The oral care is the most important to prevent the VAP for the patient, all right? So when you are using the chloroxidine, especially 0.12%, uh, all right, by cleaning the mouth, you can prevent any colonoids or the germs bacteria on the mouth, okay? What about SSI? How we can prevent the patient not to get infection from the surgical wound? It can be from the uh, using appropriate antibiotic, then to use the clipper better than suture, and to uh, maintain the post of gelico, especially for diabetic, cardiac, and to maintain the hypo or the, thermi, uh, the temperature of the patient. And if you want to get the proper information and accurate, you can get it from this trusted website, which they are CDC, the Center Disease Control. And we have WHO, which is the World Health Organization, or MOH, which is Ministry of Health in Bahrain, all right? And there is one more. We have a uh, GCC Infection Prevention and Control Manual. It is uh, the latest one, which is the third edition. You can get all the procedure of the infection control, which I explain it now. And this is my references. And in the end, I reached to my presentation. Thank you very much. God bless you all. I hope that you get benefit from my presentation. Thank you, thank you, Miles. Really, a uh, very interesting and uh, professional uh, talk about the infection control. Even the the the, the the topic is small, but you are uh, giving a very wide and uh, uh, opening a lot of doors in, in infection control, especially in uh, ICU. Uh, I really appreciate your uh, presentation, and we are waiting if there is any question from. from Uh, we'll wait a few minutes if there's any question or they say well done thanks they Thank all appreciate your uh, and i think you are covering most of the topic this is why maybe we we're not getting get... questions <laughs> yeah yeah you didn't leave anything for the audience to, to ask you are going in all the uh, details about everything in infection control So we will move to the last speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Vinyak, and he is a uh, chief resident in the Department of Cardiology in uh, Muhammad bin Khalifa Specialist Cardiac uh, Center. Uh, he will talk about uh, point of care uh, echocardiography. Dr. Vinyak, the floor is yours. Uh, can you open your uh, mic, please? Yeah. You are muted. Yes. Am I okay, right? Yes, it's okay now. Okay. So, uh, thank you again for allowing me to present. And uh, in the fag end of the presentation, I would like to talk about the point of care echocardiography. So uh, this is just focused, goal-directed and qualitative transthoracic echo. It's not a complete comprehensive echo. It's quite focused. It's qualitative, doesn't involve measurements and goal-directed. It has to answer a specific question. Uh, I was told, Dr. Mohammed Salman, that there are lots of medical students attending uh, this conference. So to my surprise, I found out that during literature review, point of care ultrasound has been included in the final year curriculum of the medical students. And it, it, it is started as early as that in terms of education. So uh, the goal of my present, the outline of my presentation would be what is point of care ultrasound, why it needs to be done, where it can do it, some evidence, and most importantly, I'll be presenting uh, cases to go. I think I'm not able to advance my slide, not sure. Yeah, so uh, what is point of care echo? 
Uh, the definition as taken from the guidelines it is it's a focused eco study performed, interpreted, and integrated in real time at the bedside by physician in adjunction to clinical exam. So it's a, it's always a complementary technique. It's not a standalone technique, and it has to answer a specific clinical question to narrow down a differential diagnosis. And it follows a predefined protocol. So it's not a detailed echo. It's it's like a, a defined protocol where we need to follow. So as you can see in this slide, uh, ECHO has been a part of many multi-organ protocol. Intensivists would be aware of these terms like FADE, which is focused as a transthoracic ECHO, a rush protocol, which tries to find the fluid all around in the abdomen, in the heart, in the lungs. And then we have an EFAST protocol. And uh, in BDF, I know that some, some of them do practice this in the ER. So ECHO finds its place in all these multi-organ protocol to only address immediate and life-threatening emergencies like uh, myocardial infarction, aortic dissection, pulmonary embolism, cardiac tamponade, and if you add up a lung ultrasound, tension pneumothorax. So why echo being used? Obviously, it's portable and versatile. It gives an instantaneous information on the cardiac structure and function, early diagnosis to speed up the decision-making process, cost-effective, no radiation contrast, and most importantly, it is repeatable with change in the patient's hemodynamics. And where you can do? Almost anywhere at point of care, wherever you would like to give the service to the patient. Uh, it can be in ER, ICU, CCUs, post-op ICUs, ambulance. In fact, even in the clinics as well, if you keep a small echo machine in the clinic and the patient is quite sick there, you can make a ready diagnosis. So what to expect from point of care echo, basically? So it, it, it gives some three assessments, the diagnostic assessment, symptom sign-based assessment, and resuscitating. So in diagnostic, obviously, for the assessment of all acute cardiac conditions, when you know that the patient has come with a certain cardiac diagnosis, so a complete echo there. Symptom and sign-based assessment, it is the clarification of the cause of the symptoms. If a patient comes with chest pain, you do an echo and find out whether the patient has MI, aortic dissection, or pulmonary embolism. Patient comes with dyspnea, patient comes with fever, you can find out a cardiac cause in terms of infective endocarditis. So it's a symptom sign-based uh, clarification as well and resuscitating. And sometimes, uh, if you look at the ACLS algorithm, we have two rhythms, a shockable rhythm and a non-shockable rhythm. Shockable rhythm, we have a good data in terms of ACLS. But non-shockable rhythm, we need to find out the cause, the PEA. So uh, it, call, it identifies the reversible cause. Most likely, the pulmonary embolism, cardiac tamponade, tension pneumothorax is being diagnosed by the resuscitative part of the point of care. So these, these are the indications of point of care echo. I've taken it from the guidelines. What I find important is what I have marked in the red. The patient who is coming with undifferentiated shock, the patient who comes with undifferentiated dyspnea, suspected acute pulmonary embolism, pericardial effusion and hemodynamic significance. Most often we want to rule out tamponade and cardiac arrest, as, we, as I spoke in cardiac arrest. So we are living in the world of data. And we always want to be sure as intensivists, at least the data is strong enough for the handheld device. We know that the data is good enough for the good big echo machines in the hands of cardiologists. But what about the intensivists doing this handheld echo? So you can see, even with the handheld echo, as uh, normal echo parameters like LV dilatation, LV systolic dysfunction has got a sensitivity and specificity at par. You can make a diagnosis more than 90%. You can see the pericardial effusion has got an extremely high uh, sensitivity and specificity. You wouldn't miss that diagnosis. So there is data and you can go ahead and practice it. So, but what to expect in real life? This is the real scenario I'm talking about. You have limited echo windows. You cannot position the patient. Ideally, you have a cutout bed and a left lateral position for echo, but no, the patient is quite sick. You will be lying down flat. Maybe you get no windows. It will be brightly lit. The emergency room are always brightly lit. Usually echo rooms are dark enough to have a good assessment of the uh, windows, but uh, emergency rooms are almost always brightly lit and you need to perform only a short study. And you have a portable echo machine, which is of less quality, less nobology, and then limited echo experience of the operator is another issue. But most importantly, there are medical legal issues, at least in this part of the world. So unless and until you are sure, uh, don't commit to the diagnosis. How to overcome these limitations? Obviously, if you have an integration of a sound clinical judgment plus acquired echo parameters, that's the key. Because flawed information may be more damaging than lack of information altogether. Now, you, you can see this slide. Uh, yeah. You can look at the height of miniaturization. It all started with a laptop kind of an echo machine. 
followed up with a small echo machine which weighs only two to three kgs in the palm of your hand. And then this is this particular machine is only 500 grams. Even the like there are some cardiologists who just keep it in their lab coat and walk around. And look at this. This is like a smartphone which is attached to the transducer. And this uh, smartphone screen acts as a display for only 2D images. So this is the miniaturization which is being happening in ICUs in terms of echo information. But in common, they should have a simple nobology, a quick startup time. In emergencies, you cannot wait for the echo machine to start very uh, late. It has to be around 10 to 15 seconds. And as you heard a very good lecture on disinfection, it has to be, it has to be easy to disinfect and clean. We are living in a COVID era. This is quite important. And a small footprint transducer. You see the foot, this is called the footprint of the echo transducer. It has to be small enough to, uh, in fact, take other views also apart from cardiac. And you should have a capacity to store your pictures because as I told medical legally, these things are very important. And this storage will allow you to share the pictures with your cardiologists. Now comes the scanning planes. I'll be very limited because this is more of a, a, live, more of a live workshop where I can do justice to this. So I'll just talk about theoretically. Uh, we, you need to know only three planes, the parasternal window, the apical window, and the subcostal window. This is what you need to know. So the pa parasternal window cuts through the heart in the long axis. As you can see, this is the plane. It cuts the heart from superior to inferior. Okay. The apical window, as you can see from here, it cuts the heart sagittally into four planes actually. And then you have a subcostal window, which is again like a sagittal window. From the parasternal window, you just rotate your probe and get the short axis. So this is the apex of the heart. You get views from apex, mid, and the base of the heart. So this is basically the scanning plane and windows, the way we acquire. And the transducer acts as a knife and it keeps cutting the heart in the axial and the sagittal plane to give us a good view. But, you, but the point is you need to know only these views, that's all. And there are certain manuals, again, this could be taught only live, but uh, these are like tilt, sweep, rotate, slide. I'll just explain you schematically. So uh, this is the transducer and this is the heart. You are just tilting your probe. You are not moving your probe from top to bottom. Only by doing this, you are visualizing coronary sinus and then you visualize the four chambers of the heart. You tilt it more anteriorly, you start looking at the aorta and you completely tilt it anteriorly, you start looking at the pulmonary wall. Then this is a sliding maneuver where you just slide the probe from the apex to the base. Apex always lies here, as uh, you know, anatomically. So if you want to see the apex, you come at fourth or fifth intercostal space just below the breast tissue. And if you want to slide further, you go to the mid papillary muscle level, you slide further down, you go into the mitral wall level. And then this is the rotating the transducer. Transducer at the heart will just stay there. You will rotate to get a different image. Like this is a place where transducer is kept with the index marker pointed towards the right shoulder. You get this characteristic parasternal long axis view. And then when you rotate it to 90 degrees without moving the transducer, you start getting some short axis views actually. So this is how there are subtle manoeuvres uh, which need to be learned when you want to start point of care echo. We only need five basic echo views. These are the positions of the index marker. This is parasternal long axis view. This is the short axis view, apical four chamber view, subcostal view, IVC. That's it. You don't deviate from this. You don't take unconventional views. You can't make a diagnosis in these views, just leave it there. But most of the time, all the emergencies, you can make a diagnosis through these views. So there is a triage, like we, we have triage in emergency. So there is something called an echo triage where the unstable patient with an undifferentiated hypotension or dyspnea would come to you. You do a quick targeted echo with a handheld device and you take only two pictures, subcostal or apical. I would suggest just subcostal. And if you see a pericardial effusion, or if you see a compressed RA and RV with dilated IVC, you assume patient may be having tamponade. If you see a severely enlarged RV rather than a compressed RV, you assume patient is having pulmonary embolism. And if you see a severely hypokinetic RV, you look into the causes of the pump failure, whether it is MI, myocarditis, or toxic causes. If it's a small hyperdynamic heart with collapsed IVC, you look at the causes of severe hypovolemia, bleeding, sepsis, and all of this. But this, this triage can only be applied if the patient is very sick, very sick with an undifferentiated shock and hypotension. So how, how do you approach an ABCD approach in performing point of care echo? I've taken this from guideline. 
you should be aware you should fight against the routine thing beyond apparent explanations you should always be suspicious you shouldn't be misled by the referral diagnosis never trust but you have to confirm comprehensiveness is something which i don't agree with because you don't need to do a complete exam uh, you have to do a focus study uh, you, you have to focus on other things as well not only echo most important is the double r which i would like to say double r means record and review you should have a machine which is able to record however bad are the images however are the artifacts just make a recording because later on you can review them you can review with your cardiologist friend and try to make out a reasonable diagnosis so I, I come to case scenarios this is what i wanted to do how point of care echo helped and one case where point of care echo should have been done so these are all live cases where i was involved so let me start off first case so this is a 56 year old male we just got a collateral history he came down to hospital with sudden onset shortness of breath followed by loss of consciousness ambulance brought him to the er with a recordable plus he was uh, pulse clinically he was in florid pulmonary edema with a systolic bp of 200 ecg signals were not discernible because patient was profoundly diaphoretic he was having a lot of sweating we were not getting a good signal of ecg the uh, the er people were a little bit uh, uh, like uh, confused so they did an abg showed severe metabolic acidosis tridel nitrates were started patient went into shock he was immediately intubated by the time they called for an echo so you can see what echo shows actually so this this is the parasternal long axis and the septum is not contracting at all compared to the posterior wall which contracts same thing in the short axis the anterior wall doesn't contract compared to all other segments and here as well in four chamber the septum doesn't contract so patient comes with a cardiogenic shock with this echo we didn't waste much time we decided we'll take him to the lab by the time patient stabilized and we did an ecg before taking the patient before really putting in a catheter in the cath lab ecg had shown right bundle branch block with st elevation in the uh, st elevation in the uh, anterior leads he was diagnosed as acute anteroceptal wall mi with cardiogenic shock but remember there wasn't any ecg during the diagnosis and he was shifted to cath lab for primary pci patient is fine case 2 He's a 57-year-old male. He had an acute onset interscapular pain and chest discomfort. ECG showed LVH by voltage criteria. There was a significant interarm BP difference, a diastolic murmur in the aortic area. A lot of information is there to have. A this is the clinical part. Urgent echo was done because of the murmur and the interarm BP difference. And you can have a look. Again, LV, RV, there is subtle LV dysfunction. There is some pericardial effusion about the RV. But just have a look at the aortic wall and above the aortic wall. The region here is above the aortic wall and this is the region below the aortic wall. I see a suspicious structure here. We zoom it down. We see here in the zoomed image, there is a flap in the aorta. With all this history, with this flap, I think by now you might have made up your diagnosis. This was a patient with this flap above the aortic wall with acute aortic dissection leading to acute aortic regurgitation. And this patient was rushed to OR for emergency surgery. Case three, quite interesting. So I was involved directly in this case. She is a 63-year-old female, morbidly obese, 140 kg. Some risk factors came to us with a presumptive diagnosis of non-ST elevated myocardial infarction. But she came on Thursday afternoon. So we just admitted her. We thought we'll do her uh, uh, like uh, cath. Uh, we'll take her to cath lab on Sunday. She was not uh, unstable. Uh, History-wise, she denied chest pain. She only had a long-standing SOB. Since she had a leak in troponins, she was admitted as non-ST non elevated myocardial infarction. Echo was normal. There was some regional wall motion abnormality in the septum. That, that is, that, that's what was reported. On the third day of admission on Sunday morning at 7.30, when I walked to the ward, the sisters were rushing into the bathroom where she had collapsed. Code red was activated. She had pulseless electrical activity. With a brief CPR, she returned to the ROSC. For some reasons, I gave her 5,000 stat heparin, but uh, I brought her down to the CCU and st still she was hypotensive and hypoxemic. I put in a probe and I see this. The first thing, this is the left ventricle, this is the right ventricle. Look at the, uh, compare the size of the right ventricle with the left ventricle. The right ventricle appears to be more dilated than the left ventricle. Of course, immediately I want to see for something more. So I see this, this is the right ventricle, this is the right atrium, Again, this is the right ventricle. This is the right atrium. So these are nothing but right atrial flea floating thrombi. Considering the clinical presentation and these echo pictures, I didn't waste much time. We immediately thrombolized the patient. 
she basically had acute pulmonary embolism with free floating right heart thrombi it's quite uh, uncommon we get it only in 4 to 18% of cases she was thrombolyzed immediately with good perfusion luckily clots disappeared with normalization of rv function and she walked out of the hospitals with no acts no acts are anticoagulants which we use in pulmonary embolism similar case now this is a case a british lady 72 year old female she uh, she had a she very intelligent female she knows a condition she said to us that she was fructophile latent deficiency for reasons we do not know she stopped her anticoagulations these patients are usually on anticoagulations she was complaining of progressive sob uh, since last two weeks when she came to when she came to us she was hypoxemic hypotensive very feeble pulse in the chest pain clinic but heart rate was 65 so we were a little bit confused but uh, when we put in a probe we saw that the rv is enlarged rv is enlarged in here it is dysfunctional and the septum is being pushed into the left ventricle you see the septum is totally being pushed into the left ventricle because of rv strain with this information couple of images and the background information of factor v latent deficiency and she stopped her anticoagulation we had no doubts we thrombolyzed even uh, we just thrombolyzed and patient was stable after that we resumed her anticoagulation and this is a case uh, which was referred to us from outside hospital with some risk factors remote pcis in the past the patient had fever cough easy fatigability progressive since few days came to the er he looked very emaciated and cachectic hypotensive peripheries were getting cooler and cooler as he stayed in the er uh, he developed atrial fibrillation with fast ventricular response uh, he he, ha- he went into acute renal failure being in er and his labs were suggestive of neutrophilic leukocytosis since he leaked uh, some enzymes and he went into act- since he went uh, uh, he had atrial fibrillation with fast ventricular response and being hypotensive again the cardiologist was involved and we put in a probe again look at this so this is this is a subcostal view of the heart these are the chambers the right ventricle the left ventricle this is a circumferential pericardial effusion circumferential pericardial effusion but wait we have more information there look at the covering of the pericardium they are all covered with fibrinous exudates right from the right right atrium to the right ventricle to the apex of the heart look in here as so all being covered actually so we zoomed that area this is the zoomed view of the right ventricle if you watch it very carefully these are all fibrinous strands which are growing in here they look like very much of exudative uh, uh, etiology and we have some pleural effusion in here as well immediately the patient he was in he was having tamponade physiology based on this echo and clinical presentation remember tamponade is a clinical diagnosis not an echo diagnosis so 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 we drained him we drained him we did an echo guided pericardiosynthesis analysis in fact later suggested exudative pathology but but the medical part they immediately started broad spectrum antibiotics when we told them that how fluid looked in fact by just looking at the fluid also you can give an estimate whether it is a transudative or exudative on it so similar case very young guy uh, he had a road traffic accident from motor vehicle injury branches trauma he was rushed in by ambulance in a state of shock unrecordable pulse very unstable monitor showed pulseless electrical activity trauma code uh, was activated in the er and they did an e fast exam e fast is a limited exam to find fluid whether it is in the abdomen heart or lungs they found fluid around pericardium and in the morrison's pouch obviously it's an acute emergency even for abdominal even for the cardiac so the cardiac surgeon was called in immediately so cardiac surgeon was shown shown only these two pictures there was a pericardial uh, effusion large circumferential tamponade and this is the ivc look at the ivc it is dilated it is not collapsing and and there are, there are some fluids being pushed into the ivc that's why you are seeing this picture so immediately we did peri- pericardiosynthesis and he was taken to the cardiac or and they found that the patient had left atrial appendage uh, uh, tear rupture so they repaired it at least the patient's hemodynamics recovered he did have a lot of other things to be sorted out but at least his hemodynamics recovered after this and he was sent back to the icu and this is the last case very unfortunate uh, a taxi driver by profession expat and uh, he is a 32 year male he had prior presentations to the emergency room in the local health center with tia like symptoms but remember these prior presentations were more of retrospective analysis uh, with uh, like when i analyzed this with the neurologist now this time he was diagnosed as generalized tonic clonic seizures and he was given phenytoin and valium in the local health center but by the time he arrived to bdf his gcs was only 3 by 15 
The neurologist could not elicit any brainstem reflexes. He was immediately intubated, transferred to the CT suite. And what they saw was he had extensive bilateral scattered infarcts, predominantly involving occipital and vertebral arch. The neurologist felt it could be a cardioembolic stroke, but they were not much interested in the echo because the patient had a very poor prognosis. In fact, the patient wasn't even shifted to ICU. It was very uh, uh, poor in terms of uh, his hemodynamics. Next day, the neurologist looks at his right leg and there was a mottling. So he diagnoses acute right lower limb ischemia and he thought that let's get an echo done and see what happens. So it's not an urgent echo to be precise, but it was more of an elective echo. But just let me show you this echo and uh, let me see what you all feel. So the LV function, RV function is good. LA is good. But look at this mass in the LA. Look at this. We zoomed into it. There is a big mass in the LA. Then we went ahead. We looked into other pictures. This is the four chamber. This is the left ventricle. This is the left atrium. You can see the mass being attached to the interatrial septum. We zoomed at it. We saw a mass which has got an irregular surface being attached to the interatrial septum. We were quite sure that is left atrial myxoma. And considering the pattern of stroke, it was all uh, cardioembolic with recurrent CVA events. So the reason was left atrial myxoma. We thought, had we done echo when he earlier presented to the ER, maybe uh, the story would have been quite, quite different. He would have been sent for surgery. And obviously, the reason for his cardioembolic uh, uh, stroke wouldn't have been there. So this is how also you can think about point of care echo. We don't have a clear guideline, but uh, this is it actually. Thanks for patient listening. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Vinayak. Uh, it's very informative and very important uh, topics also in uh, our workshop. Uh, I uh, personally uh, encourage the use of technology to improve the patient care. And I think you are giving a best practice on how we are using, you are using the point of care echocardiography to improve the patient outcome. And from all your uh, cases, scenarios, you show us how it is important and how it is uh, changing the, the diagnosis or it's also uh, given the chance for immediate uh, intervention, which is uh, show uh, improvement in the outcome of the patient. I think this will be the challenge of the medicine, how to uh, use the technology and to make it uh, also available in all our uh, practice to improve the patient care and the outcome of the patient. Uh, I'm interested on all your uh, patient scenarios that you are uh, providing, San. Uh, yeah. They were all real life cases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the scenarios are excellent, and how it is the uh, eco point of care, echocardiography, uh, changing the diagnosis and improve the patient outcome. Thanks, thanks for this uh, very informative and nice presentation on the point of care. Thank you. Uh, we are waiting for any questions. Any question. I think there is one. Yeah. yeah so one, one question. question. Yeah, so the question is, can POCUS echo be performed by residents? Absolutely, as I started my presentation by telling that in Western countries, the incorporation of point of care ultrasound, including both ultrasound and echo has been in the medical schools. You are a resident, you can definitely do it. Uh, there is a learning curve, but you have to be a little careful, confirm, record, review with your seniors and always take help of cardiologists. You have to be around cardiologists if you start want to, if you wanted to, Focus echo. You can do it. Uh, Any more questions? I, uh, the end of uh, our workshop. Uh, if there is any uh, of our speaker want to say anything at the end of the workshop, uh, Ms. Mahad, Dr. Khadija, want to add anything? I just want to thank my colleague for your, their great presentation. We gain a lot of information from this uh, beautiful workshop. Thank you for uh, Mr. Ahmed for his organization. Thank you, Dr. Ali, for giving me this chance to present with you all. And thanks for attendees for their precious time for attending our workshop. We hope they gain a lot of information. 
from our workshop and the most important from the infection control side to be applied in the clinical setting. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. And I think we'd like to thank Ahmed. Ahmed is the one who's uh, behind uh, all the technology and the preparation of the... To my pleasure, Dr. Salman. It's our pleasure to have you all uh, as a guest speaker in this uh, workshop ICU. And uh, next time, we'll see you physically, inshallah. Thank you all. Muted. Thank you, thank you, Ahmed. And uh, yes, as Ahmed say, we hope the next time it will be on uh, physical. Actually, when we are uh, preparing for this workshop, uh, most of the, our colleagues, they say the intensive care and the workshop is need on uh, hands-on practice. But because of the situation, uh, we just prepared to uh, not to hold all, acti all our activities and we can just uh, refresh the uh, knowledge by uh, virtual uh, workshop. Uh, but sure, this will be in our uh, pipelines of uh, conducting another uh, workshop and this will be on uh, hands-on and the attendees can practice uh, especially regarding the uh, eco, regarding even the infection control, they have a lot to teach on the them on, on practice. So uh, we hope the situation will improve uh, soon and then we can uh, welcome you all in, in Bahrain in our, uh, either in the, our training, uh, education plus training center or in uh, one of our uh, places to uh, welcome all the attendees and they can get the chance to also uh, direct uh, talk with the speakers and learning from them and uh, it will be a hands-on uh, workshop. Uh, I would like to thank all our uh, speakers and sure all the audience who stay with us till the end and looking to see you in another activities. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks, Dr. Thanks.